Manny Pico, uh, Colorado Springs City Council. Dennis Heisey, El Paso County yes, Commissioner. <laughs> and our CDOT, or our CDOT, our PPACG table is a little light, but we're back to you. Uh, Beverly Majeski, uh, Financial Manager. Craig Casper, Transportation Director. And who might be behind the post? Jeff Bond, Peters, and Airport Okay. Do you work your way through the, through the uh, audience there. Very good. Thank you all for being here. Agenda approval. Any changes to the agenda? Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Public comment. This would be your time for those of you in the audience. Uh, if you have would like to bring something to this board's attention that is not on the agenda, now would be the appropriate time. Seeing none there, um, this board often takes advantage of this uh, time frame. Anything from the members? I do, actually. Hi. Commissioner Clark. Never lose a moment here. Um, just uh, one thing, and I, I'm assuming it's not on our agenda today, but um, appreciated you putting together the Waters of the U.S. Uh, piece with regard to our comments to the EPA. Um, one of the things that the comment period has been extended to November 14th, I believe. Um, and so um, for those uh, either municipalities or counties that have not yet gotten their comments in, um, I would suggest that you do if you need sample resolutions. Um, obviously, we have the one that PPACG did. Um, utilities has a pretty, Colorado Springs Utilities has a pretty detailed report on that and um, El Paso County also has gotten in comments. This is important to us with regard to the EPA creating additional rules and regs um, pertaining to our, our drainage ditches to just about everything that we do with regard to uh, stormwater runoff could be construed um, under the new EPA rules as being a water of the U.S., which puts it in a whole different category, uh, triggers uh, required NEPA processes, uh, sometimes looking at the Endangered Species Act and a number of things. So the costs will increase to us locally. Um, also, there's detailed information at NACO.org, which is National Association of Counties, and you just click on the waters of the U.S., and it will take you to quite a bit of information and sample resolutions. So, um, Rob, I thank you very much. Um, I will we're also our uh, senators and our congressmen asked for uh, us to consolidate our comments and get them to their offices. So um, I think I still have what you sent us, and I'll just consolidate that and get those comments on to them. But I would encourage um, any of those municipalities or counties that have not yet done that to really look into supporting the fact that this is way overreached by the federal government. Thank you. I completely <laughs> agree. Welcome, Clerk and Recorder Williams. Thanks. Sorry I'm a little bit late. Are we in public comment? We are. Excellent. I'll be recognized for such. Um, two things. Um, first, I um, wanted to let remind folks that uh, ballots are going out on Monday. Uh, the Denver General Mail facility is open, even though it is a federal holiday. Uh, so we'll be sending out ballots. You all should be receiving ballots. Um, and all of your constituents should. Um, and then on uh, the follow a week from Monday, we'll be opening voter service and polling centers, including Manitou Springs and Fountain, and a number of other locations. Monument. Um, They're on your website. On our website. Or 
or go vote Colorado. They're actually on all sorts of information. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank Mantu Fountain Monument and the other jurisdictions that have worked with us in allowing us to either place 24-hour drop boxes or have VS voter service and polling centers. So thank you very much. Uh, and shifting hats, uh, I have asked that uh, with the November election taking place, um, that this will be my last uh, meeting on Friday as your representative of Stack, and uh, I am stepping down from that uh, and have asked Rob to place on the agenda for next month uh, that replacement. Um, I think given the election, and we've done some retreat issues and other things that I think make it now the time to be appropriate to uh, transition to a new representative for the State Transportation Advisory Committee. I appreciate the chance to serve you for the last decade. Um, and I'm excited of the progress we've made, but there's still more to be done. And so uh, Norm has worked closely uh, with me on a number of issues, and uh, he and Lisa and all the others who may be interested are uh, well prepared. Norm was actually at the retreat the entire day. Um, and um, so thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. We have been joined by Transportation Commissioner Les Gruen. Les, we're in public comment. Anything you'd like to comment on at this moment? Nothing to say other than good morning. Good morning. Consent items. We have uh, two. Unless somebody would like to pull one of those or both of those off, I would accept a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Item number five, again with the executive director's report. Rob? Great. A uh, couple topics to highlight for everyone. Most are on your agenda. Uh, it's in your packet, so uh, just to uh, highlight the uh, 2015 budget. Uh, Bevel and I will talk about that on your agenda. We've been working with the program managers uh, to figure out the budget and how to balance it, and before you is certainly a balanced budget. We'll talk about that in a couple items. Uh, we're real close to hiring the new policy and communication manager. Um, final details are not solidified, so I'll save on announcing the name until uh, we have ink to paper, uh, just in case it's the wrong name. But uh, I think we're real close. Uh, Barbara and I have also met with our insurance broker to help get the uh, uh, best deal we can for our just our health, health insurances across the board. Uh, we'll talk about that in the budget as well. But always interesting to hear what's going on in the insurance world, uh, private exchanges, all sorts of things that are come up. Uh, I would imagine the local governments have had those discussions as well. Uh, met with the Colorado Association of Regional Organizations, my peer group from around the state. Uh, we meet and talk about uh, all sorts of things the Council of Governments uh, uh, look at. I think uh, DOLA grant was a big topic. Uh, DOLA is getting into the business like CDOT is with uh, congestion mitigation air quality to try to buy compressed natural gas vehicles, stations. So I think they're throwing in about $10 million on top of CDOT's $20 million uh, for the first year. And so that's uh, something that the whole state uh, agencies are, are really uh, getting into. So the other councils of governments are figuring out what or if they can take advantage of that. So that was a pretty good discussion with that group. Uh, highlight something out of our area agency in aging. Uh, Guy has it uh, listed. He, he's been active on the Community Living Advisory Group, the CLAG. Uh, they, they have a report uh, It's due to the governor shortly. Uh, and so that, again, is a statewide effort to try to look at common issues that they want to pass on up uh, in, the, in the senior world of, of interest. Uh, finally, the uh, State Union on Aging, uh, I think it's important <coughs> to point out, uh, We've been working with their strategic planning, uh, what to do with seniors and programs that are going on around the state. Uh, bringing forth to this group will be the four-year plan next year that we do in our area agency on aging. So the state's working on their long-range planning, strategic planning. We'll be doing the same. The board will see that probably over the next six, eight months. So stay tuned for that. 
And the last thing, uh, through PPRTA, we're working on uh, another DOLA grant. DOLA is sending a million dollars to this region for the Baptist Road West project. That's a PPRTA project. So we've been working with DOLA and local uh, El Paso County folks to uh, try to get that worked out. Uh, that contract should be signed, sealed, and delivered probably within a week or two, depending on, uh, I hate to say legal review, but legal review uh, at the state and at the county. So that will be the critical path on that. Uh, that's all I'll highlight for my report. Thank you. Moving on to Transportation Advisory Committee, we'll welcome our new chair, Jennifer Irvine. And Jennifer, on the Baptist Road West, since I know you're very familiar with that, how much are we still short? Are we about there? Um, we're, I, I believe we're still short according to the engineer's estimate, but as you know, the bidding um, community, the construction community right now is, is very um, uh, hard to pin down as far as construction costs. So um, I think we'll really be finding out as we bid that contract, and we hope to put that out for advertisement at the end of October. Good. So. Uh, good afternoon, Jennifer Irvin, El Paso County. Um, uh, also the chair as... Uh, Director Heisey um, mentioned uh, we had election of officers last week, last uh, month with uh, the vacancy left by Tom Casuar's um, retirement. And so I am the new chair. Tim Roberts with the city of Colorado Springs is now the first vice chair. And Brian Vitulli with the city of Colorado Springs Mountain Metro Transit is now the second chair. So we unanimously approved um, the slate of officers for the remainder of 2014, and we will have elections in January again. So uh, the next item is that we unanimously approve the uh, TIP Amendment number 22, and that will be further discussed um, by staff as they present the item to you. But we did note an exception to the not one extra penny policy. Um, the next item, w which we also unanimously recommended to you for approval, is the Regional Non-Motorized Transportation System Plan uh, regional alignments, and there was not a lot of discussion. There's been a lot of uh, presentation on that through the subcommittee, so we're very familiar with that and made a unanimous recommendation. And then the item that had the most discussion last month was uh, the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan, the project store scores. These are the evaluation scores, and um, there's a lot of discussion in regards to that, and one of the items that we discussed at length was... Um, uh, some of the scoring that you had approved has, has uh, been adjusted, and I'm sure staff will um, be commenting on that and presenting that to you today. But um, uh, we also recognize that there's some things that we can do better, and so instead of waiting until the next plan, there was some discussion as, as far as once this plan is approved that we anticipate we'll have some discussion about trying to um, make the scoring a little bit better so that um, maybe there's some differentiation in the scoring of the project, and I'm sure that staff will um, further discuss that with you today. Um, and then the rest of the items were discussion items um, and no action items. Our next meeting is Thursday, October 16th, and we are also having a work session November 5th to work on uh, the project scoring. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Questions for Jennifer? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bob Baker with the Community Advisory Committee. Good morning. I could almost say ditto, but I won't quite. Uh, <laughs> I'll be very brief. Uh, the action items were uh, we reviewed and do recommend to the PPACG Board TIP Amendment Number 22. We reviewed and recommend to the PPACG Board the proposed regional alignments for non-motorized transportation. There was substantial discussion on both, both items, I think, in Jacqueline's notes of our meeting. Uh, that is quite well reflected, so I won't go into it, but we had uh, a number of transportation people there to discuss uh, the nuances of uh, TIP Amendment Number 22, and they did very well in clarifying that. We formed our nominating committee, and it is uh, receiving information on potential candidates for the officer positions to be held at our last meeting in 2014. Uh, the remainder of the agenda was purely informational. Thank you. We do have a question. Commissioner Clark. Right, Bob, you don't get off that easy. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Well, congratulations on being chair. Um, uh, just a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> um, no, congratulations. Um, I uh, wanted to ask too, and I, I can ask in a little more detail as we get into the non-motorized transportation system plan, um, because I didn't see um, any map of where those corridors are. I just saw very general information in our packet. Um, from what I understand, there may have been some discussion with regard to Colorado Avenue and potentially some traffic dieting, um, bike lanes, those kinds of things. Um, I know that's a big concern for the west side specifically because so many folks are traveling um, Colorado Avenue to Manitou Springs and um, how that's going to impact mobility. Um, I understand we want to share the road. We do have also bike trails that go along the west side. But um, that was a concern, and I just wanted to get your reflection on the discussion. Well, I think uh, we, we were aware of that, and uh, Welling has, uh, uh, through his Kono connections, emailed me uh, quite a bit of information. I think what we were, uh, we tended to get away from in the discussion was that these are generalized uh, alignments, major alignments, rather than specific streets. But we did discuss, and uh, we will keep that on our table, and as, as time goes on with the discussion, uh, I know that it will be a focus, particularly from Kona. Well, and, and Colorado Avenue, just to note, it's a mess. Um, and there's on-street parking. So if you eliminate on-street parking, people will have no place to park to get to their homes because there, there aren't garages, there aren't... I mean, they don't necessarily have always access on the back side. So that, I think it's Colorado Avenue. Um, the business district certainly would like to slow down traffic there. But um, at the, the other part of that is if this, there's too much traffic dieting and we just make way for bicycles and don't consider the cars and the parking, that's going to be an issue. So it's not necessarily directed at you. I just know there was some discussion, and I think it was a surprise to some folks that didn't realize that that was a proposal. In, uh, in my 17 years at, uh, as president of Goodwill, I can tell you we are so very fortunate that we didn't have clients killed uh, as they tried to uh, traverse uh, Colorado Avenue to get to the bus stop. And when I saw the proposal for streetcars running down the middle of Colorado, West Colorado Avenue, uh, it, was, uh, it was really, uh, it just doesn't make sense as we have that road structured. So, yes, we'll pay a lot of attention to it. Okay, and then also just, um, I don't know when it will come up, maybe on our agenda, but there was um, some concerns too about the proposed overpasses or inter interchanges at um, obviously Highway 24 and 21st Street, which has been an ongoing discussion with regard to the Highway 24 West corridor plan. So um, just bring those up as, as thoughts, and I'd like maybe when we get to those items to get a little more feedback from staff on those and from CDOT. Uh, we also have uh, Jim Godfrey, who was uh, the chair prior to me. Uh, we, uh, he wanted to be involved in the non-motorized uh, plan, and he sits on that and also was there to give us a report. So we'll stay very close to it. Thank, Thank you. you for your questions. Thank you. Bill Gamble, Regional Advisory Council. What, uh, what exotic location did you uh, traverse off to this time? <laughs> We met in Ellicott, driving metropolis of Ellicott at the country store. Should have been there. I have been there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that completes uh, our mandatory meetings in all the counties that we serve over the summer. Uh, and I must say that all of those meetings are very productive as we go out and meet the people where the rubber hits the road. Uh, they had <clears throat> mostly favorable comments and about what we all do and it was good to get that feedback up, uh, feedback on the ground, so uh, uh, it was good. We may still meet at uh, other places, but, you know, we have to meet at least once per year in each county, and we've done that, and uh, there may be other meetings, but we've at least satisfied that requirement. Uh, my report uh, <coughs> is going to be short. I have one item, uh, item six in your package, and that concerns the innovation and coordination uh, 
treatment of the funds that we that you approved for our use uh, in uh, $150,000. And in your packet, you'll see the results of our technical review committee. Uh, all of those requests, we had several requests, and of those that met the criteria and could be funded, we did fund all but $63,000 of that effort. Um, you have a, in your packet, you have a little sheet like this that outlines the projects that were approved. There's one that you will see that was not approved. That's the Telecounty uh, Senior Coalition request for adult daycare center. Uh, more information was needed on that, and there was a meeting yesterday uh, that I think uh, will work work satisfactorily to provide that. I, I we'll don't have the that. results of that meeting yet, but uh, uh, I'm informed that that's going well. So, and uh, Rob talked about the uh, community living advisory group and. Those are the most significant things on my report, unless you have some questions about some of the details there. Yes, sir. I've got a question for you, sir. Relative to the meeting that we had yesterday, um, I'm new to the process. I'm not sure it's going so well. Um, I wasn't really happy with the – no one took responsibility for the lack of communication, in my opinion. And I'm not sure what that's supposed to look like, so I may be overstepping my boundaries. Um, that said, I'd like to learn more about the process and try to figure out why this innovation program um, just totally disregarded this particular program without any communication whatsoever prior to the time that, that you met. So once again, I'm not familiar but um, it seemed like a tremendous program mm -hmm. slash project, and there was just um, there was nothing there other than no. Well, uh, in response to your comment about lack of communication, we asked for the additional meeting simply because of that misunderstanding or lack of communication that you described. We asked for that additional meeting just to get more information on the request to adjudicate it properly. And that was the first uh, meeting to, to help bridge that gap. So the, the process is like all the other processes, of course, with this particular money, we had this group approve what we were going to do in terms of the amount. RFPs were requested and, and they were submitted. We have a group that reviewed them and the group that reviewed them, the technical review group that reviewed those requests did not consider they had enough information to approve uh, at that point, at our meeting in Ellicott, at that point, the uh, request. So we asked for, and, and your comment about lack of communication was brought out at that meeting, so we asked for the additional meeting to bridge that gap. So uh, we can, uh, I'm sorry you weren't satisfied with the meeting yesterday. I was not part of it. I was not there, but we, we, we've got to continue to work that. I appreciate the effort. Don't get me yeah. wrong. Yeah. I appreciate, we all appreciate the effort. Um, the outcome I wasn't so thrilled with, but that's that's okay. That's okay. I, I'm glad we're doing that. The process is the one that just surprised me because if, in fact, there wasn't enough information prior to the meeting in Ellicott, why wasn't anything said at all? Well, I guess that's just not yeah, the way you work. I can't address that other than the fact we did recognize that, and that's why we asked for the additional meeting. Well, appreciate it. To, uh, you know obviate that circumstance and you know it's life happens sometimes you don't ask the question when you should ask and maybe we didn't but we did ask for you know we, we didn't discount it totally understand um, but please understand this yeah. Keller County needs an adult care program like the one that was presented mm -hmm. so let's do everything we can to try to figure out how to way to make that happen absolutely the, as it was presented, uh, it's a great program. You know, uh, Doug Baycare is pretty good, uh, especially if they have golf. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we it's will. For the rest, it's a respite program, not for the care, not for the senior itself, for the respite.
Yeah, providing a break for, for, the, for the caregiver. I've been trying to get my wife to send me to daycare, but she's... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, your point is well taken, sir. We will definitely make sure we, we ask the questions, and hopefully yesterday's meeting, I mean, everybody may not have been pleased, but at least we tried to make sure we understood the totality of what was being asked. Well, I think we'll all agree that there will be a time we will be taking care of our parents. Oh, yeah. And at that time, it will be great if we can get some respite from them because Absolutely. that's a difficult situation at best. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bill. Mobility Coordinating Committee. I saw Gail Nels. There she is. Good morning. So Gail Nels uh, representing the Mobility Coordinating Committee. We had a very uneventful meeting last month. Um, we discussed the uh, state coordinated transit. Um, we were at, at that meeting and we discussed, our group discussed what we had attended in the meetings and how it might be relevant to this community. In particular, we discussed the asset transit management uh, plan that CDOT is implementing and how that relates to our district. Because as you know, these resources, the buses are very expensive. Um, and I think of particular note to people around the table here, their, um, the State Association recognized Dennis Crosser, a member of um, our community here in Fountain as um, the Administrator of the Year. So I think we've had some uh, recognition of Dennis here locally as well. Um, we also talked about funding and timelines and what that meant. Um, we're talking about the city um, funding and the bus replacement with PPACG. There was some um, discussion about the Department of Local Affairs and um, like a mini grant for the mobility management that we discussed. Um, and also there was a discussion about the Community Transit Coalition and the uh, rolling office hours, which I believe were a success and were held recently. So any questions about what we've been up to? Questions for Ms. Nels. Thank you. You're getting off our easy. Yes, yes. Maybe early too, but <laughs> on a bus. Item number six would be action items. Uh, we'll just kick it right off with the uh, draft budget. Rob, are you uh, teeing this one up? I think Beverly is on Beverly's her way. Beverly is on her way. Okay. We'll tag team you a little bit. But she'll start. She has. Is that a ruler? Oh, yeah. In <laughs> case I have to read across the line. Oh, good. Uh, good morning. Um, so this is the first presentation of the draft 2015 budget, and it's for approval of the dues amount today, so that we may submit the dues request to our member governments for their approval or ratification in their budget processes. The proposed uh, member dues budget is 410000 It's the same as last year, and that is 400000 for PPACG programs, and that's for matching, and then 10000 for the Business Alliance lobbyist. Um, besides the dues, um, other noteworthy aspects of this balanced budget are that the employee FTEs remain the same as last year at 3685 and don't ask me what that 8.5 is, but um, there's an increase in federal, state, and foundation grant funding in the amount of 364000 and an inclusion of a proposed 2.9% market adjustment for staff salaries determined by the Denver uh, Greeley CPI, which we've been using um, for the last 10 years, and a recent Gazette article uh, concerning wage increases for Colorado Springs workers in 2015. Um, there's also an inclusion in this particular draft budget of 20 percent uh, for increase in health insurance costs, um, which currently uh, we're receiving proposals from providers for right now. And um, we don't anticipate it to be more than that, and hopefully it will be less. Um, I Normally, we don't go through the budget line by line. Um, at this point, we typically will, next month, you will get a work program from us. And um, it'll be the same budget, though, that you'll also receive. But if you wish to go through some of the details of the attachments, I would be happy to do that. Questions or comments for 
Beverly. Commissioner I Clark. I have one, and I, I don't know if it's in a line item. I'm trying to find it here. Um, with regard to the Regional Business Alliance, and is that already calculated in here, Rob? Yes. With our Okay. Um, just because uh, it's, it's certainly been important. I know Tyler was there representing PPACG when we were in D.C. Uh, last week, I guess it was. Um, and so I, I just think it's important to make sure that's included in the, in the overall budget. As long as you're not telling us they want a, an increase. No, I, not that I've heard. Okay. <laughs> nope, I think it's True, just the like, same. Yeah. yeah but having in. having that seat at the table um, on a on a national level is is really important for us. Um, and uh, I think we might might want to actually invite um, someone to come in and give us a report on the things they've been working on, uh, so that the board is is aware of how that interfaces with what we do here locally. Certainly the transportation surface bill is um, of interest to this board, I know. <laughs> Other questions? Commissioner Steen. Okay, just, just to point, Mr. Chair, the, the third bullet here is that the uh, under balance budget, under this balance budget presented for discussion, there are no member government dues increases. Well, that's true. And then in the, in the total, Correct. there are five member governments that do have dues increases. So. Right. On page... Um, Three of the draft budget details, there's a chart and it compares last year's dues for the member governments, each one separately, compared to this year's. And um, it's based on the assessed valuation of the property in their uh, loca locale. And so if the assessed valuation up in one location compared to another one, um, it would increase their dues. And you, you can see that on that chart. So the 410 remained the same, but every year this, this chart with its assessed valuation changes. So I would say there'd be no total member of government. You're more, correct. More be Thank accurate, you. More accurate. Thank you. Not to be too fine a point on it. but Thank you. Council Member Pico. Just a uh, minor question. I noticed that the share of assessed valuation shifted slightly between us. So just to understand. So I can understand what was the basis for changing the assessed valuation assessments. Um, we go online and get each year's new assessed valuation. So the latest one that is available is the 2013, and um, this is this is the way it's done every year. And sometimes it'll a member go up, uh, specific members' dues will go up, and sometimes it'll go down. And like I said, it's just based on their assessed valuation as compared to the total assessed valuation. Okay, that wasn't quite my question. Okay. Why the difference in percentage of the share? In other words, for one year you've got 88.9 and the next year you have 89.0. Granting that's a small change, but I'm just curious as to why, why the shift in the share <coughs> Not the number. Clerk and Recorder Williams. If I might. Um, this number has changed. The, the percentage has changed based on what the percentage is. Uh, and so as, so looking at the simpler county ones, because there's only three of them, Park County's <coughs> assessed valuation dropped from $444 million down to $394 million. And so their proportionate share of the total valua valuation dropped. Uh, so you add up all the valuations, divide it by percentages, allocate it by percentages. And so, um, so Park County's dues go down slightly um, because they now only represent 5.4%. So the percentage is just the share of the total. Um, oh, okay. The pie's gotten bigger. Got, okay. Right. And yeah. your share of the pie has also gotten bigger. Okay, so it's, it's shifting based. All right. Yes. Got it. So, so it's just, just based on valuation. Yeah, we're Got not it. saying the valuation of Colorado Springs went down any percent, but the number well, I was probably just, did. Yeah, I was just wondering why the percentage has shifted. In it. So, I, I got it. Got right. it. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? So. So I'm looking for a motion that approves the dues amount so we can get the letters out to the member governments um, stating what their dues will be so With that approval. they can put it. Second. Second. Can I make that motion since Sorry, our dues went down? That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so moved. You're welcome, Mark. I, I think it's been. Uh, we have several motions to approve on the on the floor. Uh, Trustee Mayor Pro Tem Tyler Stevens, senior member of the Tyler. board, whatever you are. <laughs> hey you. Uh, hey you. Just in the similar conversation, I think in our previous board meeting, we also had the conversation about initiating our 2016 dues structure early, uh, 20, uh, January or so, to have that conversation. And I think that conversation is really not about the percentages that are driven in here so much as the 410 and 205 should those bottom line numbers increase and then they filter out as to how that happens and what what does this feel is a necessary level to achieve as much as we possibly can and we can still um, feel as, uh, that it's satisfactory and justifiable you want that as part of the motion or no or I was just no. making the comments yeah just just Mr. Stein. yeah with our Keller County we, we go final on our balanced budget tomorrow Correct. So yes, right. uh, nice to get this figure by the first of August, if possible. Just okay. Um, next year in January or February, we're going to come back with an item to discuss the dues, but uh, total the 410. The thing is, is that um, another thing to keep in mind is that we do not get the assessed valuations early enough, possibly to do it in August. I mean, maybe September. I mean, we get them right, pretty much right before we do this. I would suggest it's not that important because if okay. we put that 410 up against this year's assessed valuation, get a, a, okay. a general idea as to the direction and knowing that it will change, and at least for budgetary purposes, I think people okay. can plan that there will be a change. Okay, that, that sounds great. Since the dues haven't changed, I mean, I get a lot of calls from the member government staffs, and they'll say, you know, what do you think the dues will look like this year? And I'll say, well, um, probably the total won't change. And um, then they put that in their, in their budgets. Any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you, Beverly. Good Council Member Knight, welcome. Thank you. 6B, proposed extension of PPACG contract for administrative services with the PPRTA. This uh, appears to be a Rick Sonnenberg uh, item. Yes. I think we've seen this before. <laughs> yes, about every four years. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Rick Sonnenberg. I'm the Pikes Peak RTA Program and Contracts Manager here at PPACG. Uh, PPACG has been providing contracted administrative services to the Pikes Peak RTA since the PPRTA's inception in January of 2005. PPACG staff has been providing services in the area, in the areas of administrative support to the board and the CAC, the Citizen Advisory Committee, also budget preparation, financial administration, and reporting contract administration, website management, construction field confirmation, public outreach duties such as the PPRTA annual report to the citizens, and coordination with the PPRTA external attorney and independent auditor. All nine audits, PPRTA audits, have been clean audits. The PPACG staff has provided independent oversight for the PPRTA member governments as they have spent in excess of $610 million over the nine and three quarters years of the PPRTA, including $313 million for capital projects, $225 million for maintenance projects, and $72 million for Metro Transit service. The PPACG staff believes it has been providing a quality service to the PPRTA on behalf of the members of the PPACG staff who comprise the 3.0 FTEs within the contract, I would request PPACG board approval to extend this admin services contract for another four years beginning January 1, 2015. Discussion. This is an item that would go to the, the PPRTA board, I believe, this afternoon. So both, both bodies have to agree. but. We, we should let them know if we're willing or not before they uh, tell us they'd like to be part of it. I would just say this has been one of the great partnerships. Um, you know, when the, the voters were told that administrative costs would be capped at 1%, 
Um, we have not come anywhere near that on a whole over the time period. PPACG has provided that administrative service for much less than what the voters approved, and I think that's a wonderful thing when government can actually come in below the authorized amounts. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. moved. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. 6C, I-25 Cimarron status report and project update. This is an information item. Yeah, and I'm actually just going to turn over to Karen, I believe, and our yeah. piece of PowerPoint. I can't PowerPoint? see. Do you have a PowerPoint? Or do we, is there? No. no. Okay. Not that I know of. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm not ready for the PowerPoint. I haven't seen that one. Um, yeah. I, uh, it, it was on, sorry. Uh, this is mainly just for information only as we might be coming back next month and so we wanted to prepare you for uh, the Cimarron status. Um, right now, with all the bids that have come in recently, um, I-25 Fillmore, uh, Old Ranch Road, and down in Pueblo, the Ilex Design Build Project, that was an $80 million project that when uh, it design build somewhat similar to Ilex, I'm not Ilex, Cimarron, um, in terms of size, the teams, there's two overlapping uh, design build teams on Ilex for, and on Cimarron. And when the bids came in, they came in about 20% over what we had said they were allowed to come in at. So we had said, you know, if you go over a guaranteed maximum price, your bids will be non-responsive. Well, all three bidders came in pretty high over our guaranteed maximum price. So we said, well, okay, let's see what we can do for ILEX. So we have a plan moving forward. We lost probably about four months on our schedule for that project. And so we said, well, let's take our lessons learned from what we've seen on Ilex and Fillmore and Old Ranch and let's uh, see how we're doing on Cimarron. And when we went back, and again, these construction bids that are coming in, they're really spiked. I mean, if you compare them to last summer, they're 20% more than they were last summer. So, you know, I think our um, cost estimates as of January, February, March were fine. Um, we just started seeing these bid spikes in April, May, June, July. And a lot of that's from the, f the flooding work, the contracting work that's going up in Region 4, a lot more projects going out. And, and again, CDOT did the ramp project, so we're, we're um, increasing the need in the market for construction. There's a lot of big design builds going on around the state right now. But then also the oil and gas industry is taking a lot of labor, so that's increasing the labor costs. And there's a little bit of um, material cost increase going around also. Um, the bottom line is we went back and looked at Cimarron and we talked to our contracting teams. We did update our estimate and we're about 20%, needing about 20% more funds on that project. And some of the contracting teams said, yeah, if you keep the guaranteed maximum price you have and you expect us to meet it, we're just not even going to submit anything. We're going to stop now because we know we can't meet it. So it's it's it costs them probably close to a million dollars in order to prepare the proposals for these design build efforts. And so, That's you know, true. in order for them to make it worth it, they got to make sure that it's something they can achieve. So we're when we update our estimate, I just wanted to let you know that's where we're at. The benefit to adding um, money now is that we would only lose two months in our schedule and actually when we talked to the contracting teams they said that would be um, okay with us right now that would work well so instead of us uh, opening bids in mid-november we'd opening bids in mid-january that's what we're looking at right now we're trying to add the funds by uh, end of november december to show that they're there in the project so the contractors feel comfortable moving forward and in the meantime we're kind of giving them a head nod of yeah we're moving in that direction so they can keep proceeding on the project. Commissioner Green. 
Whenever you're finished. Okay. I just, um, we are working with the city. Uh, uh, Kathleen Crager has um, been working with us closely. And we've come up with a plan to um, use RPP funds. We have enough with CDOT's new cash management to provide the additional funds needed for Cimarron as well as keep critical projects moving in, um, in the Pikes Peak area in addition to Cimarron and also balance out all of the Region 2 needs at the same time. So I'm confident that we can move forward with that. Now, RPP funds are the most flexible. That's a regional priority program. So the city recognizes that um, for all the funds that you put into Cimarron, you're not getting other projects done other places. So the city's going to come to the table with some other um, money, but that takes a little more time. So we'd front it with our PP funds, and on the back end, the city would say, okay, we're going to um, supplement or pay for these um, items on the project, and that'll free up our PP funds t for other projects later. So that's our plan right now. And I, again, I just wanted to prepare the board here for uh, probably an agenda item next month and and see if there's any particular questions that you might have. Commissioner Green. Thanks, Karen. I, I just wanted to uh, summarize things a little bit. Uh, for several months, the commission has been made aware at our monthly meetings that this has been going on throughout the state, that these bids have been coming in substantially higher than we anticipated. It's created tremendous problems. Some projects have just been put on hold indefinitely. Um, so Karen and her team, I think, were being very proactive in trying to figure out what to do to avoid a, a real problem of not getting any bids on this thing. But it's never a good situation to find out that you need a, another $20 million beyond what you expected, especially when we had such a difficult time cobbling together this initial $95, $96 million. So I, I take my hat off to Karen and all the people that uh, she worked with, all the member governments. I know she, she mentioned um, Kathleen at the city. I understand Commissioner Clark was involved in some of these meetings. I don't even know all the people that came together. So what we're doing is really what um, – RAMP has been all about is, is borrowing some money from the pot that's going to have to be backfilled later. So there's not an easy answer. Something, uh, it's not new money that's being found. It's money that, that we'll have to figure out how to replace uh, some other project that this is being used for. But we're going to move forward and, and hopefully the bids that we get are going to allow us to do just that without losing a whole lot of time, just two or three months, as Karen had said. So that's, that's my summary of, of uh, Karen's summary. Rob? Yeah, and so for the board, the uh, translation from Karen saying something's coming to the board, uh, I'm guessing it's going to be TIP Amendment 23 that will identify all these funding sources as you remember, the I-25 Cimarron project had, I don't know, a dozen funding sources in, the, in your tip that you all approved. So this time we'll bring forth uh, the other flavors. Uh, you already heard uh, the f most flexible for CDOT is that RPP. Your most flexible is that STP Metro. Uh, your tip amendment, the next item, shows a blending of that. So uh, we'll bring the tip amendment back through the committees. Uh, so the timing on that, I think the transportation committee is next week. So we'll work with CDOT to... Uh, flesh out the the actual numbers and from where because it's coming in over as, as Karen said multiple years So we'll articulate that through the tip amendment through the committees and back to you We hope next month, but if it, if it slips then um, it'll be in December But look for a tip amendment 23. I guess is the heads up <laughs> Commissioner Clark, thank you. I just um, wanted to thank Karen and, and CDOT and certainly our transportation commissioner and the uh, um, 
Director Williams said something about um, Stack will be looking at this too, but um, for figuring this out and certainly for the creativeness of those that were sitting around the table, including Kathleen Crager from the city, to figure out how we could get this fund. It is our number one project in this region and we need to get it going, otherwise it will never get finished and becoming more and more important, but um, I guess the, the disasters have raise the costs of things just because there's a lot of dollars coming in for repair of a lot of our roads around the state and uh, it's just I guess we're a victim of our own success in some ways of making sure there's enough folks that are employed at the same time it's making it difficult for the uh, for the bidding process but I just wanted to to give my appreciation to uh, to CDOT and and our Transportation Commission and all those for trying to figure out how to how to fill those gaps and certainly for the city for um, looking for some creativity and how we can get this moving moving forward I guess. Clerk and Recorder Williams. Uh, just to kind of clarify what happened in the past RPP which is the regional priority programs was down to about 10 million a year statewide. Uh, Stack and the Transportation Commission have worked together um, and that is now 50 million and that's why there's actually money that can be used to make this happen uh, because if it was at a 10 million level statewide coming up with 20 million for one region would be well you can do the math a little bit of a challenge uh, but because it's now a 50 million program annually statewide there's the ability to make that happen uh, and I do appreciate CDOT working with us to, to address these issues as um, you know, we, we go through a bidding process and we can't always control and, you know, I noticed we just had a 20% increase in health care for us that probably affects a lot of the people who are doing business with us as well. Uh, and, and so that's one of the challenges and I appreciate Karen and Les and, and their group uh, working to be able to make these projects still happen. Thank you. Other comments? Karen, appreciate the, uh, the update. Glad you're being proactive on it rather than waiting for the bids to come in and then have to hit reset. So, thank you. 6D, Transportation Improvement Program Amendment Number 22. Good morning again. This is a TIP amendment in three parts. Uh, the first part can be seen in Attachment 1, and that is uh, canceling the replacement of two vehicles uh, by Metro Met Metropolitan Transits because CDOT DTD reject, or DTR rejected their uh, request for a one-year postponement. The second part uh, can be seen in a TIP amendment or in attachment number four, which just talked about 20%-ish increase in cost for both the Fillmore and Old Ranch interchanges. So it's an additional $2 million for the Fillmore interchange that's needed and $1.7 million needed for Old Ranch. Uh, we worked with CDOT Region 2 and we're going halvesies between RPEP and our Metro dollars. So we had some Metro pool funds that hadn't been spent uh, and uh, split the cost with Region 2 on getting those projects done. And the third part is zeroing out uh, $72 million worth of pool funds um, that uh, were designated uh, as reasonable for this area as part of the TIP. And that can be seen in attachments 2 and 3. Are there any questions on Questions for staff? Clerk and Recorder Williams. With this approval, when, Karen, will these two projects begin? I think we decided since um, by the time you budget them and award them, it would be November, that they'd, we'd leave it to the contractors when they want to begin in the spring, but it would probably be closer to March of next year. Other comments, questions? Yes, so, Mayor Schneider. Thank you. So, um, w when will we have a solid funding plan for our projects? Did you say? We are working on that now. Um, I'm going around to all the TPRs. To we just met with Central Front Range TPR and came up with here's the projects for your next four years of funding. Here's your project for the next six years, and then we're that's RPP, and then there's faster safety, and we're figuring that out. So in October, we're meeting the TPRs. We're meeting with um, staff here at Pikes Peak and PACOG. Uh, we'll be working on finalizing that plan in November, December, and then we're going to do a joint um, meeting with all the TPRs and MPOs 
in January. January. So I would say January is the date that we'll have a good draft and then we'll be going through the process to approve um, that SIP update after January. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Do we have a motion to approve TIP Amendment 22? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 6E, Regional Non-Motorized Transportation System Plan, Regional Alignments. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Hi, I'm Emily Lindsay with Peg Twig Area Council of Governments, um, and I am here to talk about the Non-Motorized Plan. Let me get this Google Earth site up. All right. So I've been here a couple times in the last few months to talk about the Non-Motorized Plan and where we're at, just status updates and general process. So hopefully you all kind of remember the basic idea, but it's the non-motorized plan is part of the overall RTP. So it's one of those sub-plans, kind of like the transit plan. Um, and it's a collaboration between the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments, the city of Colorado Springs, El Paso County, and the city of Woodland Park. Um, so as a product of this plan, those three um, partners will also get sub-plans. So that's an important thing to remember, kind of as we get towards the end of this presentation, is that it's not just the regional plan that we're developing, but there's also three sub-products that will also be um, coming out of this process. So this summer I shared with you um, the progress and the development of all of these corridors. There are around 70 of them. Um, we're calling them regional improvement corridors. And these are really just A to B. Where, do pe where are people going? Where are the origins? Where are the destinations? Um, where is population density? Where are major employers? Um, and we've developed a, a report with information and data about each one of these corridors um, that will be included in the plan. So there, again, MAP21 kind of focused us on data, and we're really focusing on data-driven um, approaches for this regional non-motorized plan so that in the future, even if we don't have specific alignments, each one of these corridors has a host of data that um, is included in the plan about this. So we can go back to it and say, how many crashes were in this corridor? Or how many major employers are along this, this corridor? So it's really, a, it's going to be an asset um, moving forward, even once the plan is adopted, because there's so much data attached to each one of these elements of this plan. Um, and since then, we met with our stakeholder and technical task force, um, along with our TAC and CAC here at PPACG. And for the city-specific elements, we've also been to ATAC and to CTAB to talk to them about how this relates to their, their sub-plan and where that might be moving. Um, and they identified, a little hard to see, but 10 improvement corridors that were pretty top priority um, for looking at improvements. And they said, this is where we want to focus our efforts moving forward. And that's not saying that, that the rest of these corridors won't be included in the plan. They certainly will be. Um, just that with limited resources and time, we're going to focus some efforts in getting details, um, even more than the data that we already collected, about these 10 specific corridors. Okay. And now here we are today, um, and we've worked with all of the stakeholder groups that I mentioned, the Stakeholder Technical Task Force, the TAC, the CAC, um, and the, for the city portions, the ATAC, and their CTAB. So we've worked with a lot of different stakeholder groups to get to where we are right now. And these are, are really regional alignments, regional routes. Where should we focus even more of our efforts as we... Could you, for the, so everybody understands okay. what the, the acronyms mean? Um, the yes, the... Colorado Springs Active Transportation Advisory Committee and their Transportation Advisory Board. Um, so those are the groups that the city, city-specific areas um, talked about. We talked about these alignments with. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, okay. So these, once we have alignments, we're able to kind of finalize that draft regional non-motorized plan so we can get the whole package of data out. And, and these will allow us to focus our efforts in identifying the kinds of improvements that might be applicable. We're not outlining this is project A, B, C, D. This is just saying right now this, this route is, I don't know, an off-road trail, and we, we like that, so how can we improve that? Or are there trouble at any point along this trail crossing major roads, or do we need to, what can we do to make it easier for people to travel along these routes? Um, and those details will really come out as a project of in the draft regional non motorized plan, but we kind of needed a little bit more clarification before we got there on where to focus the limited time and resources that we have left in the planning process. Um, 
And again, not to say that all of these things won't be included in the plan, they certainly will be, but we're just hoping to get a little bit more detail um, for this last part of the plan. And yeah, the TAC and the CAC saw this earlier this month and recommended approval of these alignments moving forward in the development of the draft plan, which we're hoping to have out in January um, for comments and hopefully a final approval around March. But So there's plenty of time to comment um, once we get this draft plan out. So I'm happy to take comments or questions about the process or the specific right. corridors if anybody has any of those. Questions? Councilmember Pico. Well, I noticed that power has dropped off somehow, and I think that's a pretty major corridor, mm -hmm. um, granting, you know, the need for the others, but that struck me as a little surprising, given okay. the growth out there. Yeah, and and so you can actually see, if you go to the walkbyconnect.org website, you could, can see. Could you use your oh. cursor to kind of show us where we're talking about here? Yes, sorry, I can turn road names on, too. Hopefully, okay. okay. Yeah. So you see that um, there's a different elements of powers that were in included in the top improvement corridors. And we, I mean, we looked at residential um, and employment density along all of these areas, and you can see those in, um, if you go to our the Walk by Connect website, there's an existing conditions report that outlines kind of all of that data. But the stakeholder and task forces um, chose to move on with these 70-ish identified corridors based on the data that was collected for the region um, and where that was pointing them as far as improvement corridors that are needed within, you know, the next 15, 20 years. Yeah, I still, I, I'm kind of looking at that going, looking at the development of powers and the major need, it goes to the bases, connects all the way up north and Got, looks like you've shifted to Academy, if I'm reading this correctly. That's correct. And not powers. Yeah, actually, that just, I mean, based on the, the pure data, Academy was suggested as that main corridor that kind of moved from this side of the region up to this side of the region. Um, based on crash data that we have, or employment density, or um, residential density, or current mode usage. So there's a lot of data that went into identifying those corridors, which suggested um, academy over powers. Well, I'm not suggesting that you would not do academy, but mm -hmm. given that look, looking through all this stuff, we have a whole lot of stuff to expand powers, freeway interchanges, and so forth, right? And not the others. So that has just struck me as being a little surprising to see the emphasis on powers in some of the other plans mm -hmm. and not on this one. Yeah, and I think that maybe it's a. I mean, another factor is the existing non-motorized infrastructure and connections available to that. Right now, you'd have to put a lot into connecting even just to get to powers aside from including infrastructure along powers. So the investment would just be, I mean, so much higher than there's a lot of, a lot of con potential connections or opportunities closer to academy and closer to the denser areas. And you can kind of see that um, in those top alignments, they are closer to Oh, sorry. I can okay. also <laughs> defer to Kathleen, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Krieger. Thank you. I just wanted to answer Councilman Pico's question from the city perspective that, first of all, powers as a quarter itself might be difficult because exactly of those interchanges that you because talked about and because it's a state highway and not a city street. But the city does recognize the need for a bike route in that area, especially connecting Peterson Air Force Base. And actually at the moment we're looking at the potential of putting bike lanes on Peterson Road itself from Peterson Air Force Base all the way up to where Peterson currently stops at Dublin. And we feel that that's a really important north-south connection for that area to have a consistent bike path all the way through there and, and the city is separate from this study. The city is looking at that opportunity of trying to take advantage of that opportunity as soon as possible. Well, that makes sense. I, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't want to be biking down powers either. But, I, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I like to drive powers most days. But yeah. <laughs> uh, flying low, maybe. But yeah. uh, Okay, thank, um, thanks. I, and, I, I and appreciate it. That makes sense. We might also have some opportunities along Tut in the future as well and Rio Vista as parallel facilities to powers for non-motorized. 
as well as the green belt that kind of go mm -hmm. parallel. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, and by, thank you for the light, by the way. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Gabler. Kathleen, you might want to stay up for this, too. She's not listening. <laughs> She's ignoring you. You me. mentioned in your report that you spoke to both CTAB and HAC. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to de-acronym them again. Okay. Yeah. Um, did they have any worthwhile feedback from, from your meeting? So they actually helped us um, not just develop which corridors we're going to move forward, those, those 10 improvement corridors, but they also helped identify the alignments. Um, so between all of our different stakeholder committees, everybody was really helpful, and especially in the city, they took the time to have two after-hours workshops that went a really long time. Um, and there was a lot of thought and time put into those alignments. So yeah, absolutely, they were a big help. So they were supportive also of your Oh, yeah, absolutely. Direction? Okay. Yes. Do you have anything else that you could add from CTAP? No, I just okay. I wanted to make sure you didn't need anything, Councilwoman Gabler. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Commissioner Steen. I'm curious to know, when once we designate a route as a, as, a, as a cyclist route, what does it imply? I mean, we're talking about road width, road surface, uh, presence of other obstacles, road guards, uh, painting, striping, signaling. So that's a great question. I think there's a lot of confusion kind of, is it project specific? Is it planning specific? Yeah. What are we really trying to do here? And right now, we're just high level regional plan. This is what we want to connect A to B probably along this route. This is where the people would like to travel and be able to access. We're not at this point defining specific, um, I mean, right now it's not specific improvements. This is going to be from mile one to mile three is going to be an off system trail. Um, that kind of level of detail might be included at, in those sub plans that I was talking about. But right now we're really trying to match, um, if you remember, we did competency level mapping of, of the entire system, trying to map um, what, what the appropriate infrastructure options would be. Um, and that obviously is really left up to the entity depending on what kind of projects they're ready to implement, how much funding they have, and you know really like on the ground issues. So, Are there yeah. standards for what a bike trail looks like in terms of width, in terms of surface competency? Uh, I mean, lots of factors involved. Yeah, here. absolutely, and that's another great question. So we have, when the draft plan gets released, you'll see we did regional um, design standard guidelines, and those are tied to those competency levels, which is a really cool tool not being done anywhere else. So it's really awesome that we have this moving forward. Um, and it outlines those, those different standards. What does this look like? What does a separated um, cycle track look like? And there are a host of different options. It's a pretty huge document. So it's an exciting toolkit for us to provide to local entities and to the region so as a whole. So my point, I guess, is we, we designate something. There's some implications that follow. I mean, at this right. point, it's not project specific. Okay. So it's still at the p general planning level. Um, but as things move forward in the local planning efforts, that is where they kind of designate the project specific improvements. As kind of a follow up to Commissioner Steen, though, this somewhere in the future this will be referred back to as somebody gets more specific with their plans, they'll say, But you approved this, so obviously exactly. it must be a go. Exactly. Right, and it, obviously it depends on funding availability and, you know, the whole host of on-the-ground options. And this is kind of just a guide, a guide to those local entities of this is, this was identified as a regional improvement priority or, and this is maybe where we should focus. People want to move from this destination to this destination along this route or alignment. Um, so, yeah. I, I guess my point was just that this plan means something and this vote means something even though we're not approving the whole plan. Um, right. I would Mayor like to Pro Tem. So. I think the other, the 30,000 foot level that I take away is that particularly looking at the west side there is that this is a great document, great identification tool for that as a priority and trying to make those interconnectivity um, modes much better and coordinated so that, you know, you don't have disconnected um, paths or trails Can't or get there from you, here. That, Absolutely. plus you don't have an emphasis on powers when really there's a emphasis somewhere else you know that the city of Colorado Springs isn't expending the you know the priority resources on powers that is not as high a priority as Academy or something like that so that there's a prioritization for these utilizations and these um, connectivity throughout the region and that there's emphasis on particular quarters to get success and connectivity rather than just piecemeal, hey, we've got a great successful trail, but it doesn't connect with anything else. 
Yeah, you got it. Absolutely. And and I like that you brought up that regional perspective. This really is about connecting the region as a whole from the non motorized right system and, and reducing those misconnections and those mislinks that we currently have in the system. Commissioner Clark. Thank you. I, I have a couple of process questions and that I think relate to the previous um, the previous questions. Um, first of all, who's on the stakeholder task force and does that just include those who are interested in in biking or, or not biking it's not bikers necessarily but cyclists um, and then um, how broad is the corridors that you're looking at in terms of um, and, I, and I'll use just because I'm more familiar with it the west side as we talk about Colorado Avenue versus the Midland Trail which was designed for multi-use um, and then so now are we going to be encouraging people to get onto streets where there's a lot of traffic rather and narrowing down those um, those lanes and potentially affecting parking and, and other safety issues? How, how does this all work in terms of the draft plan? Is this just a general we're kind of identifying areas? Um, and then um, as it relates to where the pencil meets the paper at the very end, is it PPACG or the entity like the City of Colorado Springs in this particular case that would decide where those bike lanes go, um, whether they're sharrows, whether there's, I mean, there's a lot of controversy that comes along when you start determining where those areas are. And I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I, I, I understand and we need a lot of different ways to get there and we want to encourage cycling versus just taking your car on the other hand I don't want the cars to get left out of the discussion because mobility affects a lot of things including our air quality and a number of other things so um, how does all of that fit together okay that's a lot of questions I know but hopefully I can do this <laughs> but I had to get them all I had to get them out all out at once so all right <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess I'll start with, this is a good lens, the, the latter part of your question, which is the entities are the ones that actually apply for the projects and decide this is where this trail is, or, or facility is going to go. That's not um, a PPACG decision. That's up to the local entity, obviously, where to implement the, pro the projects. And then specifically, you mentioned Colorado Ave. Um, and actually, when our stakeholders were looking at this and they were looking at that um, Manitou Springs to downtown Colorado Springs corridor that's a, a half mile wide. They're, they're thinking where, where about do we want to focus our efforts and what alignment are we going to focus? And they actually chose the working with city staff as well, obviously, um, the Midland Trail as that, as that connection. Um, so you can see that they were taking into account, you know, what is happening on Colorado Ave. We don't want to kind of interfere with that. What's the safest? What's the most efficient? What's the most effective route? Um, and they actually went with the Midland Trail. So, so that I hope covers the Colorado Ave that, specific. Um, yeah, but other other roads may be affected mm -hmm. by this as well. Um, yeah. And and there are already actually designated bike trails along, in fact, Pikes Peak Avenue. Right. Uh, West Pikes Peak is a is a designated That's how I get bike to work, route. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yes. I happen to know because I live on it. So. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so when it gets down to that project level, how are we going to accommodate this and the automobiles and whatever other modes transit might be? Um, that is a local entity discussion. Uh, uh, I mean, depending on yeah who it is and what roadway it's on. They're up doing still the designs and facility types. That's not really at the region level. So that might be included at the subline, but that's really something that the local entities are discussing um, and the draft will be released when then? In January. Providing we approve for the, this today. For the regional plan, yes. Okay, and then additional processes will take place after that to be more specific on those. Yeah, so the city will have their orders. own sub plan and they will have their own kind of, um, they'll go over that with their committees and the process as well. So right now I'm just talking at the, for the regional plan, that one big 30,000 foot level. Okay. Um, and then as far as other questions, the stakeholder task force, who is on the stakeholder task force? It's this long list of people, um, which I will spare you from reading all of them, but it is everybody from bicycle advocacy groups to public health groups to schools to business groups. The, um, we have neighborhood associations. We have special needs and services. We have trails and open space um, focused advocacy groups. We have just, uh, I mean, a host of, of stakeholders, and it's really been a, a great experience working with everybody. We have everybody from the U.S. Olympic Committee to the Regional Business Alliance um, to, you know, 
kids on bikes. We have just a host of stakeholders that are coming together. And surprisingly, most of them, you know, for the first time, all in one room, which is really exciting. So it's a broad, broad stakeholder group and not just kind of the usual suspects. Yes, Mayor Snyder. Well, uh, Sally, I certainly understand your point, and I, we can put it on the map that people are going to use the Midland multi-purpose trail, but the bikers aren't going to use it. Okay, it drives me crazy because we put a lot into putting that thing in there. We have Pikes Peak Avenue as the bike route. They don't use that much either. They, you know, I, I, it's much like Colorado Springs raises speed limit on Highway 25 to 65 because that's what everybody was going anyway. I think we kind of have to just recognize that bikers are a whole different mindset. They want to be on the road, they, you know, whether they're commuting or recreating. It's not just about convenience. It's about making a statement. They, they like to be right out there on the road saying, hey, look at me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm reducing carbon, I'm not doing anything bad to the environment, I'm a biker. And I just have kind of given up, to tell you the truth, on trying to direct them. I think a biker's a little different, and they are on the road. So. <laughs> and much like the bikers, you don't want to upset the motorcycle community. You don't want to upset the biking community either. Because you see on Colorado Avenue, there's groups of 20, 30-plus people biking out there at noon on any given day. No, I agree with you, but I, I just, I don't, you know, you, we look at the West Side Avenue action plan, and we're building bike, we're, we're incorporating bike lanes in there as just kind of a recognition that no matter what we do, they're going to bike there anyway. So I, I, I would love to find a way to nudge them to be more safe, to use these wonderful multi-purpose trails, but the reality is they don't. And so I think we might have to recognize that a little bit and... You know, I, I knew damage. this this would not go without a comment from Commissioner uh, <laughs> Dwallaby. There's, 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 you you got to break cyclists down into two groups. Um, Maya January is seven years old, and she doesn't like riding on Colorado Springs Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So the seven-year-olds and the parents in, the, in that group and, and then the folks, with, you know, that are <clears> – <throat> more family oriented that that group really does enjoy the bike paths and and if you you know up in the mountains if, if you check the um, parking areas along the bike routes they're full of folks from other areas they're full of the, the visitors that are coming and it, and it offers them a um, more comfortable way to travel and enjoy their vacation uh, there's groups of bikers and uh, uh, road bikers that ride, like to ride certain paths that are really good paths that are flowing fast. But if you get a bunch of kids and dogs and leashes and people on rollerblades and stuff like that, and you're on a road bike and you're doing, uh, you know, Mark Cavendish hits 50 miles an hour in a flat sprint. So some people can go really fast on those bikes. And then you, you're trying to do that. Those actually blend better with cars. So it, it all depends on the biker. Cyclist. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Steen. Just to clarify, this plan is not about recreational cycling. It, it, it's, it's about get-to-work cycling. Is that, is that right, Emily? So, yeah, so, so the routes, cycling, you, you, utility cycling, utility cycling. Cycling to the purpose, not cycling for rec. Well, recreation is a purpose. Don't. <laughs> That's why people come to Colorado. It, well, I don't, what's well, that norm? The corner's look, coming up. <laughs> if, you cycle, if you have bike paths, you're going to have recreationists on those bike paths. And they're going to use them not to get to work, but they will also go to work. So it, it's going to be multi-use, and, 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 and they're, they're going to go everywhere. They're going to go wherever they can go legally. So you're going to have them all over, but it gives a route for them, for, for the families and kids and, and folks visiting, too. Kathleen, did you have something to add? I did. I just wanted to say that, that one of the reasons why you see the map with set the sort of large tapeworms for um, corridors instead of, <laughs> yeah, well, they're sort of, yeah, they go all over the city. Visual. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> instead of just, but instead of just a simple line of where a particular trail or bike path may be, it's because we have all different types of bicyclists. And we do have bicyclists that enjoy biking on the trails and particularly a trail like Midland, which is why we really want to complete it as soon as possible so that you can bike from downtown Colorado Springs to downtown Manitou Springs and back. That's a great trail. But we also have commuting bicyclists who want to be on a city street that they have very few stops on, so that means an arterial street. 
which is why we're looking at how do we safely and effectively combine biking on Colorado Avenue with keeping cars on Colorado Avenue, which is what we're trying to do um, in the, the new section of Colorado Avenue between 31st and US 24. But you also have people more like me, the putsy bicyclist, who even the trail gets a little fast for me. And I like biking on a city residential street so I can stop and go, oh, look at the color of that house. That's great. Um, so we also need those bike routes that are on um, less active streets, Cucheros or Pikes Peak, so that you've got a way for that type of bicycle to get around. So the city really views these corridors as opportunities to provide for all types of bicyclists. And in these major corridors, that's what we're going to be looking to do is how do we accommodate all types of bicyclists in them. Commissioner Steen. One more question. So will these routes be graded like we've grade streets in terms of like ADT and in the other factors are used to how we build a highway? Will, will, will routes be differentiated in terms of their in structure the, based on the traffic count? Right. The, the will. city will be designing okay. anything that comes out of this study. And it, while it's not rated for ADT or that type of thing, yeah, we do design it in terms of what kind of bicyclist is using that particular facility. Because the person who wants to bike on Colorado Avenue is very different than the person who will use the Midland Trail. And so we accommodate those accordingly. Um, someone who wants to bike on Colorado Avenue wants to go as fast as traffic if they can. They don't want to stop excessively. Um, or at all. Or at all. <laughs> yeah. um, they don't, they don't, well, they, they can just run them, Sally. It's okay. <laughs> they, can, they don't want... They don't want drainage dips in their way and that type of thing that they have to slow down to. So that's a very different cyclist than what you might find on a residential street. Um, for example, we just striped Corona as a bike boulevard, and it's a wonderful street to sort of putz down and get downtown and look at great houses and that type of thing. But it's very different than the bicyclists that would be biking down an arterial street and seeing if they can keep up with traffic. Do you have Oh, yes. Okay, okay. So I understand. There are people that bike to work virtually every day of the year, and their goal is to do it quickly, um, you know, hopefully as fast as they can do it in the car, and they are on our arterial streets, and, and we need to try to accommodate that. On the other hand, I don't want to build a bike lane on a busy, on, say, Woodman, that looks like a 10-year-old could bike down it because it's not for a 10-year-old. Council Member Knight. Wait a second, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Mm -hmm. You know, if it, if it weren't for this podium, I'd get no exercise at all. Uh -uh. <laughs> Since you brought up biking on Woodman, um, Woodman up in Peregrine, you know, we had the constituent constraints that put bike lines on both sides of the road, and when you put in a bike lane, that makes it no parking on the side of the road. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, where will the neighborhoods have a chance to input on this to make sure that, uh, you know, curbside parking doesn't totally go away? Right, and uh, that's an unfortunate situation that happened before I came to the city, but the, the sort of rule of thumb that we're following at the city now is that any bike lane that would involve um, road dieting or striping a road that had not been striped previously, making some kind of major change, requires um, neighborhood meetings. In fact, it was neighborhood meetings for Corona Street that resulted in a change of that design from one type of bike path to another. So we will do public involvement. And our, the other thing that we look at very carefully is where parking is needed and not put a bike lane in in place of parking when that parking is actively used. Um, because parking can be crucial to people, uh, especially if they are in an older neighborhood where they may not have the driveway and that type of thing that the suburbs might have. So we all will consider parking, and we also will have neighborhood meetings anytime we're changing striping that sort of changes the look of the road. Um, hopefully our goal is 
we have some awfully wide streets out there, so our hope is there's a lot of streets that we can have a, a parking lane, a bike lane, and then room for traffic as well. Thank you. So bringing this back to the 10 corridors that have been identified, are, are we comfortable with moving ahead with those, or, or do you want to have meetings with Emily and ask why your corridor is not included, or why it is? Let's go for the tapeworms. <laughs> do, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Good discussion. 6F, 2040 moving forward update. Good morning again. Greg, welcome. Um, the, uh, what we're looking for here is approval of the scores for use in developing our fiscally constrained, actually more than one fiscally constrained portfolio so we can do a comparison. Uh, these scores have been well received by both advisory committees. Uh, TAC unanimously recommended them. Um, I want to emphasize that the scores are not the decision maker. They are used to inform the development of uh, fiscally constrained portfolios, lists of projects. Uh, what we have to do uh, is look at the, what different colors of money um, can fund. So, uh, CMAC can't be used to fund extra capacity. Um, so every, every color of money has its things you can do and things you can't do. Also, what we found in the scoring is um, if there's a serious need Oftentimes, two projects both meet that need, but you only need to build one of the two projects. And figuring out which of those two projects um, is, a, is a discussion also. So um, we've, got, we've got the scores. We, what we don't have, and you'll see next month, are the funding levels. Um, we're working on those. We think we have uh, uh, some draft funding levels to email out to the TAC as part of the TAC packet for next, uh, next week's TAC meeting. Um, and that will help us then uh, figure out how far up and down the line it, um, funding line is going to float. I will tell you there is significantly less funding available, and we have a higher rate of inflation to this plan than we had last time. So we are going to have noticeably fewer projects. Um, we just don't know exactly which those are yet. Clerk and Recorder Williams. Craig, the hard copy we have is in alphabetical order. Yes. Uh, the one you have looks like it's actually sorted by score. Correct. Which is actually a fairly useful way. Uh, yeah, it's weighted score. Right, weighted score. And uh, so I've gone through and been working on coming up with, and your chart matches mine so far. Um, can we get this electronically? I think it went out yesterday. Yeah, I was going to say. Okay. Yep. You had one of those. Yep. Thank you. I missed that last That's night. Sorry. Um, uh, but it is interesting to see the wide variety of projects that scored highly. Yes. Can you scroll down a little bit? Sure. There's, what, 384 of them? By the time we hit 442, all the money's gone. Yeah. Well, that's if you go straight down the list. <laughs> um, <laughs> 680 billion. Right. So, and that's uh, only about uh, 12 projects. Yeah. So. Commissioner Steen. Greg, I thought our discussion at the work session was really helpful. Could you kind of inform the rest of the group on some of the ways you might rank how, how these scores might inform us and some of the options that might result? Uh, well, the uh, simplest way to do is an unweighted score, look at what, how all the projects score, just use the unweighted score. You can apply the weighting and get, get a weighted score. Um, there's looking at which projects best meet the total sum goals. It's a mathematical model. Um, there's also a different philosophies. Let's do maintenance first. You know, maintenance is our highest weighted. Let's do <coughs> maintenance type projects first, go down the line until all the maintenance projects funding are gone. There's congestion philosophy. Let's make sure congestion, let's do our congested projects first. Um, bridges, you know, we don't want a bridge to fall down. We can take, our pavement can be in a little worse condition, but bridges, if they, they're not working, that whole street's not working, so you can fund all the bridges first. Um, and so it's just looking at different philosophies of, of how to uh, use the scores to inform development portfolios. Uh, we're going to start a discussion that's um, with the TAC uh, this month, uh, we've got a workshop scheduled for the 1st of November, or the 5th of November, actually, um, to refine that. But it's coming up with what, you know, what best meets the overall goals of our region, um, what our emphasis should be, and what does that look like then when we start applying those as a, as a set, as a portfolio investment, what happens? 
Rob? Sure. Uh, and I think uh, Craig, you may have said it too, but uh, a reminder for the board that of these, all these projects, and we say the funding is going to be less and we're only going to fund 20 or less uh, projects through some of the funding categories. Remember, all your local projects are already in the fiscally constrained plan. So if you're funding it locally, the PPRTA is funding it. If there's other sources for a trail or anything transportation, you're automatically in the fiscally constrained plan, which is a good check mark to then go after all sorts of other money. But I want to make sure you're not hearing that, yeah, we're going to do 12 projects, and that's actually a, that's a different philosophical discussion of, you know, the board can allocate money to 10 projects pretty easily, but you have 260 projects uh, on the list right now. And so I think the portfolios will be real helpful for the subcommittees, for your staffs, the citizens, and eventually the board. How do you come up with the list of money? We haven't applied the money yet, but once we get on that list uh, with whatever strategy, that will be your fiscally constrained project list. And we're curious, too, to see how that comes out. Mayor Pro Tem Stevens. And to that, and I appreciate you asking the question of, of Craig, and I think that you have great uh, institutional knowledge and also national knowledge that can help inform this board as to how to make those prioritizations. I'm curious as to whether you'd be willing to uh, give us a brief paragraph long email about some of those philosophies just sort of outline oh, exactly what you just def said. Definitely. And then perhaps just take this same spreadsheet and spend a few minutes not in depth but out illustrate what some of those applied to this might look like and then you know perhaps within those buckets and categories and prioritization, maybe nationally there's been someone that's taken 30 percent towards maintenance first, filled that bucket, then whatever, and sort of play with that and give us some, some perspective and how that might play out on this, because I, I would suspect that this board is going to react to the prioritization. It's not going to catch our attention until our project is dropped off much less, you know, how we came to that decision. Yeah, yeah we refer to those as straw dogs because everybody can kick them around then and nobody really can. But um, <laughs> one of the things in, in doing some cursory uh, um, look at it, we don't have the funding to do all of our maintenance. Our maintenance backlog exceeds our funding. We don't have the money to do all of our congestion. So I, one of the things I was talking about at the workshop, the roads you're driving today are the best condition the roads are going to be in region-wide for the next 25 years. They're also the safest and least congested they're going to be for the next 25 years. From here, it's all downhill. So I wanted our, our, plan, our plan theme to be making the future slightly less bad. And, and so, so but that, didn't, that didn't sell. I didn't get that by me somehow. Yeah. Do you moonlight as a motivational speaker somewhere? <laughs> Yeah. We're going to spend how much to make it yeah. less bad? We're about three, three and a half billion dollars to make the future slightly less bad. Yeah. So, Commissioner Dwallaby. You know, I've spent the last few years uh, working with Craig and, and Wayne and uh, Norm now is stepping in and, and uh, the, you know, being on stack. And, you know, Craig's making light of this. And, and in a, it hurts him. It hurts him to say that. It, it, we're, we're trying to decide between maintaining a road, putting pavement on it, or fixing the bridge so that the road doesn't fall into the river and the people don't go down. And, and, and it's, uh, this is really important, and, it's gonna, and he's right. There is no funding, and, and it's, we have to think of priorities. And, you know, th this is just a brutal uh, reality of what the future is going to be. And, and if you don't want to sit and long lines or at the bottom of the river or, or <laughs> bouncing down the road. You know, it, it'll be to where you're going to have to get monster trucks just to make it to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bicycles <Rainbow>. beware. <laughs> <laughs> or bicycles. Maybe that's what will happen. You that's the only way we can afford to travel anymore. We won't be able to afford the highways. But this is serious stuff, you know. Commissioner Gruen wrestles with it every day. Uh, we, you know, we, we just did our little – uh, deal with with stack and got re reoriented, <laughs> but uh, the, it, it's this is a real problem and it's not going to go away and something has to change. Some you know there has to be some sort of a change. Looking to see who has has not spoke on this. We'll, we'll come back to uh, repeats here. Uh, Steyer, go Just ahead. Just briefly going back to. Um, 
uh, our trip in Washington last week, this is a national trend as well. And it's, it's really awakening. I think we'll see this in the reauthorization and transportation bill. And we've seen it in the most recent authorization as well. It's the emphasis of, of not just fi fixing on the single vehicle and the single occupancy vehicle transportation mode. It's not a sustainable mode that we can uh, buy and build our way out of and provide for congestion relief, air quality, and transportation means simply with the single occupancy vehicle. We have to look at all the different modes and how they interact within the transportation system. And to that end, we have to look at how we can move people and goods in the most efficient and sustainable fashion that we possibly can. And that involves our, our conversation we just had at the last agenda item and on motorized. It involves transit, it involves infrastructure, it involves all sorts of different things. It involves how do we safely get these multiple modes um, uh, interacting safely together. Wayne. And this may be to provide a little bit of historical perspective uh, for folks. Governor Ritter formed a advisory panel um, I served on the technical advisory panel for the advisory panel. Uh, their conclusion was that CDOT's budget needed to be two and a half billion a year. Um, less, that's not how much you have. One point two, one point one. It, in, in fact, it went down from one and a half billion down to about 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 billion. Um, you abs this is not unique to the Pikes Peak area. We're in a little better shape because of the Pikes Peak RTA. But the rest of the state, I mean, there were all these folks. We had all these meetings. Some of you were at them. Some of us were as far away as Durango for meetings. But until the state's willing to take the leadership, and this is not a CDOT issue. CDOT's not the one that puts issues on the ballot. CDOT's not the one that sets the budget. But the governor's office then told CDOT they couldn't testify about the revenue impact of bills on CDOT. Hmm. Um, and so CDOT used to provide the legislature with a revenue estimate that said, if you pass this bill, this takes this much away from transportation. And they stopped doing that because the governor's office directed them not to. Hmm. Um, this, whether it's the state, whether it's the federal government, you cannot continue to live off of our parents' transportation infrastructure. And that's what we've been doing. Uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, infrastructure was invested in. And we are living off that today. You look at an interstate system that has not changed significantly since in the last 20 years, despite the vast increase in population because the funding has not been there. And CDOT's done lots of great things to try and address what they can do with the little amount they have. But no matter how much CDOT does, no matter how much they manage their funds, they cannot build an infrastructure to address the needs of a state twice the population with half the budget. It just doesn't work. And I, having been on the campaign trail for the last year and having people testify around or make campaign promises around the state, when someone promises they can deliver awesomeness just by eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse or being efficient, you cannot build these things without money. Um, and ultimately, you're going to have to have a serious conversation. Impact 64 looked at it, and the polling said this was not the time to do it. But at some point, the only way we avoid Craig's scenario is to put some money into it. You cannot build stuff with the existing funding stream. You cannot address the needs with the existing funding stream. Commissioner Gruen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's great to hear these conversations because this is what we talk about at the Transportation Commission every month. Uh, I agree 100 percent with Clerk and Recorder Williams in what he said, but he really underscored a couple of issues. One, we would all benefit from additional transportation funding. That's one issue. I think the more important issue is what do we do 
without it, and that's sort of what Craig's talking about. And we've done a great job during the term that I served as Transportation Commissioner at PPACG of, at a state level or, or with the, the big regional improvements, understanding how to better prioritize what we do with limited resources. And it sounds like this discussion is just taking that down to the regional level. So I applaud you for doing that. It's critical. I, I don't see, even though there's the need for more transportation resources, I don't see that happening in the short term. We certainly don't assume that at the state level. So just figuring out how the limited resources we have is most effectively spent is the way that I think we benefit most people. Mayor Snyder. I certainly understand all the brilliant points that you guys just made, but I think for this region, it just seems like we're the perpetual bridesmaid. I mean, we just, we're looking at the tip. I was just doing some cocktail napkin counting here. It looks like they're sweeping up $72 million out of our pools, and you know, we'll be lucky to get $52 million back. And so I just have this perception. I understand limited resources the state need, but this region, we just seem to perpetually be shorted. And I hate to, you know, sound that note again, but it seems like, I don't know that Dr. Cog, they got a funding plan in place already, don't they, for their future pr transportation projects? And, One you know, I mean, sure. $2 billion going into the viaduct, and I, you know, I get it, this, you know, this top-down approach that that's, that's, is if making CDOT more efficient, I think is somewhat coming at our expense. And... I, I wish there was a way to address that. Being the bridesmaid's not Wayne? bad. Well, <laughs> it's old after a while. I look better in a bridesmaid's dress. <laughs> I, I, I think Mayor Snyder has raised a concern that's legitimate, but here's so so. It, you guys know that for 10 years I've been advocating for funding for this region. But here's the problem. When you cut out a third of CDOT's budget, which is effectively what's happened since the Owens administration, uh, when you cut out a third of CDOT's budget, what do you cut? And the answer is you cut new projects. You cut expansion. You go to maintain what you have. And... Our region gets screwed by that because we have nothing. Uh, historically, when you look at lane miles per population, we have by far the fewest CDOT lane miles. And that's because when CDOT laid out its system, when our parents, grandparents built the system, there were no people in El Paso County. El Paso County has gone from a small county that was smaller than Pueblo to being the state's most populous county. And as it's done that, CDOT has not had the money to keep the road system up in comparison to the population. And there is no foreseeable way to do that without a funding increase. Because when, right, you, you gotta plow the roads, you gotta fill the potholes, you gotta repave what you have, you have to build, rebuild the existing bridges. <coughs> So the bridge enterprise goes through, and almost all the bridges are outside the Pikes Peak area because most of our bridges were built recently. We're a fairly new community. We don't have old bridges. Um, we got a few. We have a few. <laughs> we have a few. And some of those have been replaced. Um, and some of those were addressed in the I-25 um, expansion. But... The problem we have at the state level is if 80% or 90% of CDOT's money goes to maintenance and you have comparatively little, you get comparatively little. And it's, it's not from a dislike, it's just that they're maintaining what they have and, and, and so we lose out in that. Um, we did okay, if you look at percentages, when the CDOT had money for expansion because we needed the expansion and we're certainly justified. And if you look at our strategic projects, I-25 and Powers Boulevard, both are 442 or 490 on this rating scale, so they're still priority projects. 
um, there's just not the money that's needed. And we'll, uh, so, so I leave Norm and Les, challenges to address as they go forward. <laughs> uh, but that's the challenge, and it, it, it's, not, it, it's not the fault of CDOT. It is the fault of the policymakers who have not funded the transportation system. Um, CDOTs, I, I mean, we're not, when I became a commissioner, we didn't have anything environmentally cleared, so we couldn't build anything when money became available. We worked with CDOT to get powers environmentally cleared, to get I-25 environmentally cleared so we could build stuff. So bring, bringing this back. <laughs> bring, yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I at least wanted to address Mark's issue. Ultimately, right. you know, We'll, we'll give our, our Region 2 director the, uh, the final say here, and then we'll be looking for a motion as to whether we're going to move forward with 2040 plan or not. Karen? And um, so, Mayor Schneider, I just want to let you know that everyone's on the same schedule in terms of getting this step updated by June 2015. So we're, we're on schedule for it as to whether Dr. Cog is – you know, has a tighter plan at this moment or not doesn't isn't really relevant. We're all on the same schedule, and and what Wayne's talking about is again we get fifty million dollars of that one point one billion dollar budget to do what we want with. Um, in the meantime, I'm working hard what in what he's talking about asset management stuff, maintaining what you have to make sure that it's going to the places that we need to go, bridges that are in the poorest condition get treated. First, and it goes back to that data-driven stuff. But we're also making sure we have other sources of fund and that whatever needs you guys have, you'll get. And I, and I will say, too, that um, in the past, maybe you've sacrificed for other priorities like Trinidad. But I would say just in the next two years, you guys will benefit because you'll probably take more of your share um, for RPP in order to get these critical projects funded. And then, you know, we'll shift to other things. So I am trying to, as regional director, make sure that the most urgent needs around the region get met, but all the region have their needs met. But a bit like Wayne said, we get discretion with $50 million statewide. So that's $10 million that comes to Region 2. And by formula, that's $4 million that comes to Pike Peak. Um, Roughly, but we did increase that amount. But again, it went from instead of us getting nine million, now we get ten million for our region. So that's the bottom line problem with okay, we got more than our share was before, but really we're talking about more of a really minor percentage. So until we get more funds, it's hard to do anything significant in terms of improvements. Thank you. And thank you, and I have a very good memory. <laughs> I remember all the things you said here today. Thank you. <laughs> do, do we have a motion to approve the weighted project evaluation scores? So moved. Second. Any further comments? We'll go to Commissioner Steen and then uh, Councilmember Knight. Greg, what does a zero mean? There was no score that it did, it did not apply. That it didn't um, that it um, like in stormwater, it did not reduce or um, whatever the, the phrase. No was. effect on that. No effect on that category. And that's one of the things that uh, Jennifer alluded to earlier. We we're, we looked at the scores yeah. and we made some on the fly adjustments because what we originally laid out didn't work to differentiate between projects. The idea. We, we use the assumption that all the projects that were submitted are good projects, and what we need to do is differentiate between them, and some of the criteria work against each other. Some of them you don't really differentiate, serve to differentiate um, adverse impacts. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? How do you score an adverse impact? So uh, what we figured out is you don't have to use all of our goals to score the projects. We just have to evaluate the portfolio and how the portfolio achieves the goals for the whole plan. So we're going to be going back with the TAC and the CAC yeah. to adjust our, our approach to scoring on by both by individual category and overall. Well, so. we're going to think about it. In our work session, again, we talked about perhaps scoring projects, rating higher projects that have no zero entries. Right, and that is, that's one of the mathematical things that you can do. So any zero entry would eliminate it, would move it lower on the list, for example, yeah. Yeah, yeah and we have, you know, with stormwater and adverse impacts and those, there's a whole bunch that... 
Organic I mean, sewers. to some of you, I'd just go through. You might have, like, I don't know, Project 18, Atrazon, Atrazon built Boulevard, adding, uh, you know, increasing bridge capacity that has no effect on conge congestion reduction. So just one anecdotal example, but it, it just seems odd that it wouldn't have some impact. Zero. Yeah, uh, and, and that's where the, um, where we used our the model. And there's, if you widen the bridge, there will be additional capacity. The question is, is there the need on either end of it? Is that a road that going in 2040, you know, it, what's the congestion look like? With our small area forecast, um, it played a major, especially with the way it laid out this time, with a much more growth north and east and um, basically holding the city at the level or slightly declining. <coughs> um, the c projects in the city didn't really score on the congestion. Even though they're congested now by 2040, with some decline, they're not the readjustment of distribution of households and jobs, so. Okay. Council Member Knight. Yeah, my, my pause here is because I'm still kind of confused because Mayor Stevens asked that, uh, you know, we get some additional data, and then you said earlier it all depends on, you know, which priority you put first as to how this thing is going to be funded. So what are exactly are we approving? With his vote, then use of these scores to develop fiscally constrained portfolios. Okay. Other comments? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Item number seven: Pike Peak Military Care Network. Let me find me. Actually, that's Peak. No Pike in front of it. Hello. Well, hi, Kate. Hi. Thank you for the, what a nice welcome. Do you want me to save this, Craig? Uh, delete it. <laughs> <laughs> we can rewrite it later. I'll find my. You got to put I got an a hard order. copy for you. Yeah, we can. <laughs> uh, Kate Hatton, Peak Military Care Network. I also wanted to recognize we have. Uh, General West Clark, who is our advisory board chair, and Command Sergeant Major, retired. Terrence McWilliams, who is our vice chair and will be our chair next year. So there's some plants in the audience, if you will. So I just wanted to give you an update of kind of where we are. Um, I'm not going to go back to the beginning of time, but just always remind folks what the mission, vision, and purpose of the Peak Military Care Network really to uh, connect service members, veterans, and families to services. And we do that by, you know, bridging gaps and making sure there's less duplication of effort. And really it's about health and well-being for those service members, veterans, and families, and for the communities as a whole. Our goals and objectives, I won't read them all because I'm going to go through them individually, but really it's around how do we do that? How do we make those connections and how do we make that work and really build community capacity to support our military and veteran community? Again, information and assistance centralized, increasing awareness and access to services, and streamlining those connections. We have the Network of Care website that we use as sort of the beginning. That was we started that in 2011, and that provides a lot of good information and resources. Needing those who need call-in assistance, we use with partnering with Pike Speak United Way, again, trying to leverage existing resources. What already exists, we don't want to duplicate. We don't want to, uh, you know, again, fragment those. We want to bring th folks together and using a centralized resource to do that. So, again, using those partnerships, we also, during that call center, we triage folks. It's rather, it's not just a straight up, you're looking for rent assistance, okay, here's a connection. We ask questions about, you know, are you active duty, are you a veteran? Are you, uh, what was your discharge status? When did you serve? Which helps identify what resources may be available or not so we can connect folks to the right resources the first time so that they don't get frustrated. And it also helps identify maybe there's a bigger issue. Why is somebody needing rent assistance? Or have they called for rent assistance three times in the past six months or rent assistance this month and utility assistance the next month or uh, some other things? Maybe they need a job. Maybe there are other things that we're trying to get to. And so that's what we try and identify up front rather than wait until hopefully folks are in crisis. Um, the other piece is really how do we do that collaboratively. We have a, a, a network of partner agencies, 23 partners to date. It might be 24 by the end of the week, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. And really, again, very broad-based, um, whether those are financial assistance, advocacy services, legal services, transportation. Amblicab is one of our partner agencies. Gail, in the background there. 
um, and really behavior health, social services, employment, transition services, uh, people who have children with special needs, people who have um, older relatives that they're caring for. So really trying to be very broad-based and address needs proactively and in a kind of broad-based manner. Wes didn't want me to use the word holistic. <laughs> okay. Oh, shh. Um, and again, uh, working with those partners agencies, one of the challenges is when we started this many years ago that many folks in the community were serving service members and families and veterans and didn't know how to speak the language. We can acronym a lot if you'd like, Commissioner Clark, but maybe not. So um, so what we try to do is what are those acronyms? What does it mean? What is a DD-214 and why would someone need to know that? Um, so really trying to get to that. And then we evaluate the, the partner agency trainings we have that we ask them. And again, these are folks who have been doing this for a while now. Often military installations are part of those meetings. And they are all, well, mostly, the green and blues are good. Yellows are okay. Um, occasionally we have an outlier who didn't learn anything, but that's okay. Uh, that gives us information that we can move the needle a little bit more on. But really, they're, not only are they getting more information, learning about what other folks do, understanding their, um, increasing their understanding of military and veteran culture, as well as what other, you know, again, trying to triage and streamline access to information, and they've indicated that that helps them collaborate and do business better. So that's what we're really trying to do is get people to change the way they're doing business, and we've been doing that so that we are doing a more efficient and better job of serving service members, veterans, and families. Um, leadership structure, the advisory board, again, uh, sorry, it's for the, you know, six-point font there, but there are a lot of them. We have 21 advisory board members covering military installations, VA, military, um, business community, providers, service providers, as well as the service members, veterans, and families themselves, who uh, we could build the best ship in the world, but if it doesn't meet their needs, it's pointless. So want to make sure they're very involved and engaged in the process um, and really can then address high-level issues and questions and, and uh, when, when, when big issues come up, can kind of focus on those and say, hey, how do we need to adjust? Um, okay, sorry, there are acronyms here. I'll we'll deal with that in a minute. And how do we really – it's really about making sure that service members, veterans, and the communities are, are doing better um, and that we're working to improve things. This is really a sampling of the calls that we've taken. We started the call center in – a. We started beta testing in about February, kind of went live in April. Um, some challenges in, in data and those sorts of things. But if we're getting, the, again, what we know so far is that of that sampling, the majority of callers are veterans, 40% or so are you know, post-9-11 veterans, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Enduring Freedom, and New Dawn. Those are the you know, most recent conflicts. There you go. So I think I'd spell them out. I, um, <laughs> I'll have a cheat sheet for you. Um, and really, what the, a lot of them are looking for financial assistance. So really, that they're calling because they're already having challenges. And that when they call two one one, but again, they are identifying themselves as military or veteran connected, so we can get them to additional resources um, and try and get to the root of those problems and deal with the bigger picture issues. Um, some of those kind of community metrics around the return on investment is really and the number there on forty thousand dollars a year is a national number on what a, homelessness costs on an annual basis. Here, I see the number is about forty fifty seven thousand in the Colorado Springs area based on a study, and I think those are the, what the local homeless um, advocates are using. Um, again, really, we're saving money. We keep people out of crisis, keep people out of jails, out of hospitals with intensive behavioral issues, um, and keeping them employed. It saves the military installations or the DOD uh, itself, um, unemployment benefits and those sorts of things. So really, we're trying to save money here in the long run, but really make sure that folks are kind of doing well. And just to kind of put it in a lot of words on those, in a historical historical perspective, we went from kind of that siloed environment, starting to break down those silos. You know, we had a three-legged stool is not that sturdy, and we've really got a multi-legged stool now um, between the partner agencies, the call center, the trainings, and really trying to connect folks to it. Um, I wish I had a better graphic. That stool, I don't, I don't know if I've got 23 legs on that stool, but anyway. And to kind of give you some personal stories about how that really has been helping folks, we've got veterans who talk about their need for broad-based support, not just one issue, but really being able to address their kind of, again, holistic needs, uh, making sure, not just them, the family, and all the challenges that might be. Um, and, you know, veteran gets out, they may have access to TRICARE or VA services. The family members may not. Or a girlfriend or a boyfriend may not, but how do they, if they're part of that family structure, how do we make sure that we're working, again, with the whole family as well? Um, police department, and, and again, the service providers talking about how the importance and the benefits of them working together to really identify needs and troubleshoot and say, hey, I've got an issue. And they meet monthly to try and deal with some of those things, and how do I address that? Or I had a challenge connecting to 
one of one of you all, how do we fix that? So those are because it's not perfect and never will be perfect, but we want to keep addressing and, and moving forward. Um, again, we did a lot in 2012 and 2013, but I kind of wanted to focus on what we've done uh, in terms of building the plane and, and making it fly, if you will. The call center launch happened this year. Um, that gives us a, a chance to collect more data. With 23 partner agencies, you have 23 different sets of data collected differently in different ways. And so how do we kind of clarify what information is, who, who everyone is serving. And those partner agencies serve more than 25,000 service members, veterans, and families. So the reach of the peak military care network as a whole is, is pretty broad and pretty and, and growing. Um, we've also partnered with Asthma Point and Rocky Mountain Human Services for navigation services. About 20 to 30 percent of those calls that come through the call center, those folks don't just need one thing, they need multiple things. Um, or they have a family member who has a variety of, of, of needs and challenges, so we can connect them to navigators who can work with them for a longer period of time and identify the big picture issues. Um, uh, wh one example is a Vietnam, I might have given you this one before, so if I have, stop me, but a uh, Vietnam era widow who called for food assistance and didn't know about the Peak Military Care Network, but when they asked further, she was about to lose her house. Her husband had passed away and he had lost his, she had lost his benefits and didn't know how to transfer them, so able to work with her to get those benefits transferred so she had income, mm -hmm. um, get her the emergency food and stuff that she needed, also work with the bank to say, let's keep this person in her house. Um, and it turned out that her son was also a veteran living in the house, and they were able to connect him to a job. So that's just one example of how it works when it works well. Uh, the data collection analysis I mentioned, it's very important to kind of track that to be able to show that we're moving the needle on these things. We're looking at, again, the individual level up to the system level. Where are we doing? I think it's going to take a longer term to really say um, and, and correlate back to the overall suicide rate in the region or unemployment rates and those sorts of things. But we're working on building that information as well. And again, the expansion of the partner agency network, 23 partner agencies, probably 24 by the end of the week, and then growing, really trying to make sure we've covered all those bases and growing in terms of the region and who we're serving and how we're serving. Um, what we're looking to do in 2015 is continue what we've been doing and build on it. Um, continuing to add partner agencies, again, access to more services, continuing to doing those trainings, um, a more formalized navigation support and doing that more as we see what the needs are, what the challenges are. Um, again, partner agency outreach and outreach to the community. Again, there's, well, there's some weird things going on in the world right now, but there's some sense too that, uh, you may have heard of them, uh, that you know, the wars are over. We're bringing folks home, um, and that, so the problems are going away. And that's not even the case. And I think, in fact, it'll be more of a challenge for communities who are going to be taking on transitioning service members and those who didn't think they were going to be getting out and thought they were going to stay in for 20 years and told after maybe 10, 12, 16 years of service that you will get out. And you won't have those retiree benefits that you would get at 20 years. So those are the things that we're looking for, and how does that affect the community? These are going to be people who are looking for jobs, and how do we connect them to jobs? So that's really what the next step is, one of the next pieces. Are, I'll go back to one of the uh, top ones, the highlighted ones in purple that are really new. Um, we're partnering with Mount Carmel of Colorado, who has a, they're going to bring us a facility online to try and co-locate services. There's a focus on, again, those transition needs and how we bring those together. Um, so the conversations now around which, what services should be in that facility, what agencies, partner agencies would want to be there to be able to provide services. Um, would it be workforce center folks? Would it be um, financial assistance, financial counseling, access to benefits, those sorts of things. So all those conversations are going on now, but that will, we think, help on the community side as once folks get out the gates, and actually what we want to do is get to them before they're outside the gates, um, to be able to have a place to go in addition to, we've always talked about web-based call-in and walk-in facilities and assistance to be able to be, again, more than just that three-legged stool. And then so what we're trying to build is that a proactive way so that the folks go through transition processes and and the military installations are doing really everything they can to inform and educate service members as they get out. And there's a different, you know, level of interest of those folks getting out in terms of how much paying attention they are or what their needs are or they think they got it figured out or maybe that first job when they get out isn't really what they thought it was going to be and isn't what they want um, because they really didn't do the homework up front about what they want to be when they grow up. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but that's another story. Um, so really trying to, how do we connect and work with the military installations, get to them before they separate, 
not like the week before they separate, six to 12 months before they separate, identify what those needs are going to be. Okay, you're going to get out and you're not going to have TRICARE benefits. What do you need to do healthcare wise? What do you need to do employment wise? Do you want to stay in this region? What do you need? Do you need some training to be able to get that job that you really want that's available here? So, and then um, after, during and after separation, stay with them as well too. So we want to build that resource and ability to be more proactive because as you saw with the call center, those folks that are calling in are already in some level of crisis. They're already having trouble paying their rent or paying their utilities. Um, and it may just be, you know, something happened, light got in the way, um, or maybe a, a systemic issue. So how do we really address all those pieces? So that's what we really want to do is get in front of the problem and be more proactive and continue to outreach um, and, and keep that crisis system in place, but also be able to, be able to you know, decrease the demands on the crisis services and be more proactive. So that's really what we're looking to do in 2015. We are in the process of applying for a grant to make that happen. Hopefully we'll know in November what that is. Um, We'd love letters of support from you all on that. Um, also looking to make sure that we continue the partnership with PPACG. Um, you've been very involved, obviously, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant, partner agencies who work with the Area Agency on Aging a lot um, in terms of outreach to veterans and retirees. So you want to keep that going. So I, I'm going to see if Terrence or Wes have anything they want to add to that or um, apparently what's that? And I have, you know, some... Yeah, while you're sure. passing those out, just let me add that... Uh, uh, we've several in this room know this. We've talked about this for a long time about how to coordinate all the various support agencies in uh, in the Pikes Peak region, as far south as Pueblo, Canyon City. So it's not just a a local community problem. It is a huge problem for this entire area that we get some kind of coordination among all of the providers of care for the military, the veterans, and their families out here, and that's. Uh, that's what this is really focused on. It's looking really good right now. I mean, the recent partnership with Mount Carmel is going to uh, provide us a physical location, so we'll have a lot of these care providers uh, living in one area. I think uh, I think we're right on the verge of doing something that uh, that can pro provide a model for other places, state, and perhaps even a model for national use to go forward. And I'll just make a plug for community support where obviously funding is always a challenge and getting support from a broad-based range of you know, community partners, um, grants, every other component. So we, you may be hearing from us again on those parts as well, too, as we look forward. And the general here, he did good, but let me bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> but in a nutshell, what are we talking about? We're talking about healthy communities. A lot of your discussion earlier is about the community, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about America's son and daughters who volunteer to defend this nation. And when it's less than 1% of this nation that stood up and answered the call to serve, the onus is on us, the community, to help the military in that transition back into civilian life. And these men and women and their families are part, they are core fabric of this community. And if we want to have healthy communities, then the onus is on us as a community to kind of be there to put these services in place to help them in that transition so that they are healthy, productive citizens of the community. And that's why it's critical. And it's even critical now, especially with the physical crisis at the national level, my 31-year career, I've seen this time and time again, at the end of each conflict, we go through a massive reduction in force, and we just put these folks back out in the community, and they're not properly prepared to enter that sector. And it creates a lot of problems on the community. Crime goes up, citizens are fearful, and then we label them. Our homeless rate goes up. So our goal is to ensure that they're not homeless, they're not criminals, that they're productive citizens in the community, and we have a healthy community that's thriving. <coughs> that's what the Pete Military Care Network is about. Amen. Hua. Hua. Hey, Andy. Questions? Any? Anybody? Yep. Right. Woo-hoo. Oh, please. <laughs> I know you have trouble looking left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's just that you were wearing blue, and I just didn't recognize you. <laughs> Blending in over here. <laughs> Uh, but but Kate, definitely, can, can we get a copy of this presentation sure. too? That would be perfect. But I just wanted to piggyback on this. You know, the Board of County Commissioners, we really recognize the importance of this, and we are actively wanting to partner. So I definitely want uh, us to get on our calendar so we can sit down and have a meeting. But we stood up a regional military task force to specifically work with agencies like this on these particular objectives. And also, we want to work with our military installations because when we start thinking about policy issues we really need to be thinking proactively with creating a legislative agenda to make sure that we're working with our installations so that we aren't doing things for example with uh, you know where we're talking about egress issues those types of things we want to be working with them because we were out in Washington DC and I tell you it's as dysfunctional as you can believe but we sat in on several military briefings and the level of frustration out there from our commanders is it's concerning I mean this is like the third year where we've gone out there and each year it gets a little bit worse they just want to do their job and I think the message that we need to send to people is we really need a budget it ultimately comes down to what men and women every single day in your homes we need to put pressure on our policymakers to create a budget because we're asking the people that are that have to defend this country to make certain decisions without the necessary resources to actually do the job. You know, we can't do more with less. Readiness is starting to be become an issue, and the current path that we're on is unacceptable. So all of us as policymakers, we need to raise our hand and be willing to, you know, basically go out there and, and bring issues up that are very tough for communities to talk about. And working with this particular organizations and working with installations we want to show that we are committed to exactly that to the men and women that that serve because the challenge is, is growing you know the world is not a safe and touchy-feely place we have a uh, you know a big mission ahead of us but we want to continue to invite everybody to participate in this process so love to get together with you and you definitely have our support thank you well said thank you anybody else question or comment please yeah okay uh, how would you assess your collaboration with the out-of-network agencies, so those that are not military-focused primarily, but those have sort of the general population. Have they been receptive to your mission, and how cooperative are they? They're pretty cooperative. Um, they're not – there are more than 2,000 nonprofits in this community. Not everybody's going to sign the MOU. Well, I'm talking like things, uh, but IRS, uh, so, CDC, oh. Colorado Department of Human Services, so. uh, all, all those other agencies that provide services to – I mean, big soldiers are people, too. Right. You know, and, and they have other needs that are not specifically military. How, how receptive have those? IRS haven't talked to, but, you know, the D DHS and El Paso County DHS is a partner agency as well. Um, so we try and work with those as well, too. And we will we, – if we're going to connect somebody, we're going to connect them to the right service, even if it's not a partner agency. And so we have conversations broadly with other groups who participate and have uh, shown engagement, interested in participating in military and veteran issues. So we certainly try and do – and, again, it, sometimes it's around education around what those needs are and what those challenges are. And a lot of that's with employers, too, in terms of, you know, what, how to keep and retain a veteran uh, employment. But so we try and work with I them guess well. my point is that uh, everybody around this table works with other agencies, right. uh, non-military agencies, every day. So if there's an agency or an area that you think that it's not, not as connected or as cooperative, uh, I mean, I, I'd be welcome to, you know, engaging with you to you may help. I do a lot of work with uh, Colorado Department of Human Services, for example. If there are child care issues, adult, uh, adult care issues, if there are child neglect and abuse issues, uh, the, w whether they're really engaging uh, peak military that as they should, when there's more work to be done, you know, I, I'm all in. I, that's uh, great. So yeah. I'm sure there's more to do. I, and it's tro I, had, I can't outreach yeah. to everybody, so we try sure. and rely on the partner agencies and you all sure. to help make that conversation okay. happen. We work, do work with Alliance for Kids as well in terms of child care issues and early okay. care and education. Um, Community Partnership for Child Development is one of our partner agencies, so they help carry the torch on some of those issues as well, too. But absolutely, if there's someone that we can engage that you can think of that we haven't talked to, we want to be able to do that. And if, I'll give you information to share as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And will you come back in November after you hear from your grant award and let us know uh, so we can continue to be ready to work in partnership with you? Sure. Okay. Don't forget to look to the right, too. Yes. 
I never miss you, Sally. I, yeah. um, Kate, I, I just wanted to thank you. I know you all have been working on this a long time. Is is Peak Military Care Work uh, Network um, a 501c3, or are you or, speaking of the IRS? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so, so that folks, I mean, are they able to donate to your um, to the cause? Yes, through the National Homeland Defense Foundation. Under a, a, tra a transition agreement with PPACG, we've partnered with the National Homeland Defense Foundation. PMCN is a program underneath the National Homeland Defense Foundation. That's the 501c3. So how would there be, let's say I donated money Colorado to, Gives Day is coming up. Can you definitely? Designate it, no, but can you designate yes. it directly to you, even if it goes through the foundation, so it doesn't get lost in Absolutely. the bigger, the bigger pot. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, and just to kind of tag on to uh, Commissioner Steen and Commissioner Glenn's comments, um, as it relates to being involved in the task force that um, that Daryl mentioned, um, and I think the other counties that are interested should also do that. Um, how are you interfacing with our veteran services offices at the county level? I see Jim Tackett on a yeah. regular basis at fairs and things. Um, I would love for them to become a partner agency, but I know they're building, but they're very busy and overwhelmed, and so we haven't kind of closed the loop on that piece. But we do, and we refer folks to the veteran service office on a regular basis. So that's seeing, how we certainly we absolutely see a do lot them. every. And, and if we could provide you know them again more tools in their toolbox because they're seeing folks for benefits and disability benefits and healthcare and those sorts of things. The other sort of unlikely ally you might think about too is the court system, um, just because we do have a veterans court in um, in the fourth judicial, and um, I think that that's an important it is trying to figure out how we how we work more collectively with sort of the veterans to figure out how we keep them out of the jail system and certainly make sure that they have a chance to succeed. Um, the other component, as I think um, Mr. Steen mentioned, is the behavioral health issues and how we can help. And that's, I think, where Human Services and Aspen Point and other agencies could come in to assist. Um, child protection, as we know, um, domestic violence, those kinds of things are just indicative of the transfers in and out. So um, spread that net as wide as you can to sort of cross-think because there's a lot of different folks that are doing a lot of things in the community that may not be directly related to the military, but they do help military families and personnel. Absolutely, we and we work with, we have in, in conversations and talk with the Veteran Trauma Court. Um, and Aspen Point, CASA, TESA, our partner agencies as well too. Again, trying to, again, cast a very broad net, again, very broad-based around um, a range of services, Cedar Springs as well too, um, working with UCCS now too and Pikes Peak Community Cut. So trying to really be very broad. Thanks. Anybody else? Always great to see you, Kate. Thanks, Thanks for the update yeah. and keep up the good work. Thank you. Well, folks, we are already two hours and 20 minutes into our meeting here. And, uh, One minute. Appreciate uh, well, it's certainly hard to follow distinguished military leaders on the <laughs> agenda. Um, I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I promise that I will go through it very quickly because I know we uh, do not have much time. Um, every year I give a uh, update on the 2014 ozone season. Uh, to the PPACG Board of Directors. This usually occurs around uh, se September or October. Um, we look forward to it every year. I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. And this year it's going to be special because I'm going to go into the chemical composition and formation of ozone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to spend at least 15 minutes just going, on, going into that. Ozone is a... a a very unstable um, molecule. It consists of uh, three uh, oxygen atoms. So that, that's as far as I'll get. Um, it's uh, the ozone concentrations are highest during the s summer months. Uh, that's when we usually see them spike: uh, June, July, and August. This is uh, because ozone is unusual because, like I mentioned, it is a uh, unstable molecule. And it's not emitted directly as a pollutant. It actually forms um, from a chemical reaction between uh, nitrogen oxide and hydrocarbons, uh, volatile organic compounds. So it's not like particulate matter or carbon monoxide or, or carbon di dioxide actually uh, forms. 
in, in the air. There's two ozone monitors located in the region, U.S. Air Force Academy and Manitou Springs. Our ozone airship boundaries, they're the same as the MPO planning uh, boundaries. So the, it's the same boundaries that's, that the uh, Long Range Transportation Plan and the uh, Transportation Planning Department uses uh, in, in their planning. Um, sources of ozone, in our area they're actually primarily automobiles while in other areas uh, such as the front range it's a uh, it's oil and gas wells this uh, these two tables are um, also in your packet this shows the five highest concentrations in 2012 and uh, through 2014 for the two ozone monitoring stations in our region um, what's important to recognize in this top table is that concentrations were extremely low this year. Um, the lowest they've actually been probably in over, over a decade. Um, so this really dropped the, the th three-year average. As you can see, um, for the fourth max for 2014, for the U.S. Air Force Academy, that was at 0 .064. Uh, last year, 2013, it was 0 .074, so much higher. And at Mantu Springs, the fourth max for 2014 was 0 .061, and last year it was <clears throat> 0 .072. Um, ozone, for ozone, the standard is 0 .075 parts per million. It's a three-year average of the fourth highest concentration. So it's somewhat confusing on the far right-hand side of that table, you can see what the, the three-year average is. So the 0 .071 you see in the last column for 2014 uh, for the U.S. Air Force Academy, that's the three-year average for the fourth max for 2012 through 2014. And for Manitou Springs, it dropped to 0 .069. The last table there um, kind of shows you some of the reasons why ozone concentrations were, were so low this year. If you look at the mean temperatures and the average maximum temperatures um, measured at the Colorado Springs Airport and compare those um, from 2014 to 2013 and 2012, you'll notice a roughly one to three degree difference between 2014 and 13 and about a three to six degree difference between 2014 to 2012. So those low temperatures um, re reduced ozone concentrations. In addition to that, we didn't have as many many days um, as we have had in 2013 and 12 that were greater than 90, 90 degrees. And when you get those hot, sunny days, that's when you usually see the highest ozone concentrations. And we actually had higher precipitation uh, this year in the summer than we have had in the past, too. So for all reasons, we really notice a, a significant drop in ozone concentrations. This table just um, shows what the, uh, what the three-year average uh, is compared to the current standard of 0 .075. If you'll notice, again, for the 0 .071 is for the U.S. Air Force Academy. Uh, that's the uh, purple box. And for Manitou Springs, the diamond, it's uh, 0 0.069 parts per million. So we had a, a significant drop in, in that three-year average, as you can see in this table. But um, in the next slide that I'll, I'll go through, you'll see how if the EPA does change the standard to a range somewhere between 0 0.06 and 0 0.070 parts per million, that we will not be in, in, in attainment of the standard anymore. So if you look on on the uh, vertical axis where it says 0 0.06 to 0 0.07. The, the EPA is thinking about setting the ozone standard somewhere in that range. So if you look um, at that range, we will definitely not be in compliance for the standard along with 90 to 95 percent of um, all counties that actually monitor for ozone. So it was recently, there was a recent court decision. Um, the U.S. Uh, District Judge announced that they want the EPA to issue a draft proposal by December 1st 
um, of, the, uh, of the new ozone concentration and a final rule by October 1st, 2015. Like I mentioned, the proposal is somewhere in between the range of 60 and, seven, and 70 parts per million. This has been delayed for a, a number of years and it's been ha held up in the courts. But the, uh, the Clean Air Science Advisory C Committee and the EPA are, are kind of sticking with uh, that, th that recommendation. And below there is, is the EPA timeline based upon that uh, f final rule of October 2015. Attainment plans would be due between 2020 and 2021. What that attainment plan is kind of how your area will go ahead and demonstrate attainments um, of the standards. So you know, kind of what regulations your, your area, so what regulations El Paso County would put in place to go ahead and demonstrate the attainment of the standard. And that, of course, would depend upon where they set that standard at. Um, there are, this is just a summary of the air quality monitoring stations in El Paso County. We have two ozone monitors, like I mentioned. We have one particulate matter uh, a monitor at Colorado College, one uh, CO monitor at Highway 24 and 8th Street, and one sulfur dioxide monitor located at Highway 24 and 8th Street. This graph just shows, um, you know, we're in compliance of the 24-hour uh, PM 2.5 standard. They dropped the standard in 2012 to uh, 12 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. You know, we're, we're still far below that standard. Um, of course, for carbon monoxide, we've always been uh, well below the standard. We're at it. Concentrations have been in the range of one to two parts per million, and the standard is, is at nine. For sulfur dioxide, this monitor just went in place uh, in 2013. And for uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, the, the concentration is, is determined actually uh, based upon a three-year average of the 99th percentile. So right now we just have one data point. And that one data point shows we're at 58 parts per billion. So although we do not have three data points, um, we cannot determine exactly if we would be in attainment, but you know, based upon the 99th percentile for 2013, it looks like we'll be fine. With that, I wanted to go pretty quickly through it. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Oh, thank you for your brevity. Sure. And, uh, Real quick, I don't get late here, but how do you move the needle? You move the needle, a, a example would be um, implementations of a emissions testing per program, um, in, implementation of an um, onboard diagnostic program. Um, an, an OBD program, you, you know those lights in your cars that most people ignore that says check engine light, you know, it, it usually ha has to do with some emissions testing. Equipment, it would actually require people to uh, get get those lights checked. Yeah, so, I'm just noticing what moved in the past, if you look at, uh, I mean, what happened between 2008 and 2011, that's significant in the in the Colorado Springs economy. When we had the biggest dip in in uh, ozone, I don't think we want to go through that again. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and and you know, that's just it. No, exactly. Yeah. You know, you know, you know and and. As you can see, weather weather really probably moves moves the needle more than you know in anything else. So I mean, you could have actually lots of regulations and policies in place, but it it won't uh, do anything. As as far as looking at at the new standard, one one uh, issue that I'll be looking at, at closely in uh, implementation of standards, if they'll go ahead and, and discount how much is coming into your region from other sources. Because if you look at the source of apportionment modeling that's been done here, uh, more than 50% of the concentrations that, that we're getting are from outside our area. So as far as moving the, the, the needle, you really don't have that much to play with. That's, so. Okay. Oh, for cooler, wetter yes. summers. <laughs> we'll set that policy. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> we'll like yeah, I got a scooter. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Thanks. Uh, where are we here? Moving forward, Chapter Two. Yes, in our continued effort to get chapters out to you so that they don't get dumped on you at once. Uh, this month, you have the regional setting, which is 81 pages strong on its own. 
Uh, it's more robust than most expect because we need to show – in order um, – it's allowed now for decisions that are made in long-range planning to stick and not have to be revisited in NEPA, but you have to show you considered adequately the um, potential significant effects. So uh, what happens is our regional setting starts to look like the existing conditions of a NEPA of an EI. Uh, so that's why it's a little more robust than expected. Um, 81 pages. It's a good read. Gives you some interesting information about our region. Uh, next month, uh, you should look for a financial plan and health. We're still looking at January for uh... – that's, that's, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. um, no other uh, MPO is going to meet that goal in the state, but we're, we're going to see. It depends on how the portfolio's discussion goes um, with the financial, because we, we actually don't – I don't – the financial plan. Hopefully you'll have it next month if it goes smoothly. Um, we don't know how that's actually going to go because we haven't right. finalized or even got draft numbers yet, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Craig? Thank you. Thanks, Craig. And now we can move on to 7D, Established Nominating Committee for Officers for 2015. Okay. Uh, this is a quick item. Uh, I will send the entire board, because they're not out here, uh, an email <laughs> to gauge whether board members are interested in serving as a board officer, serving on the nominating committee, or just voting. Uh, normally this month we just alert you to all positions that are available, the conventions, uh, usually we shift uh, after two years in uh, one of the positions uh, as board officer. So look for that email and uh, we'll take verbals uh, today as well. I nominate Keith. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for what? <laughs> <laughs> Nominating. Oh. So you'll send out uh, an email to everybody sure. and then they can respond directly to you yep. with their thoughts. Get back on to you <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Rob. Sure. Member entity announcements. I can tell you Coffin Race, October 25th in Manitou Springs, one of our iconic events. Uh, we have more entrance than ever this year. So. Uh, Yes, we are. We, we, we just love our visitors out there. So keep mark that date. Any other members? Please, Tyler. Uh, the town of Greenmount Falls is nearing uh, completion on our town hall, and we preliminarily set the date for a grand opening as the 15th of November. So that's uh, our hope. Time, Tyler? Do you know yet? Don't know yet. I, I suspect so. When it's not snowing. <laughs> <laughs> we, shall, we shall find out. Um, and obviously, once we get the date finalized and such, we have a planning committee meeting next week that will probably nail that down and start getting invites out. Well, congratulations on nearing the end of that difficult uh, project in full circumstance. So. Any other member entity announcements? Uh, Norm Steen, Teller County. I just want to thank for all of El Paso County for driving through Teller County the last two weeks. During the, the <laughs> we had some tremendous traffic, and uh, hopefully the Aspens uh, made the trip worthwhile. I was one of those. Good. Thank you for making the trip. The you and uh, eighty-five thousand other people. As long as they spend money while they're up there, that's all that counts, right? <laughs> okay. Are the leaves still up there? Yeah, are, but they're just about over. Yeah. Okay. Any other member entity announcements? Anybody? No? Okay, so meeting schedule. Rob, when's our next meeting? It's going to be November 14th. November 14th. That's what I was when, Is it that? Really? 12th. 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 November 12th. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would be the 12th because the 11th is better next time. Thank you. I was going to announce the workshop on the 7th. You can see all sorts of financial planning and sorting of spreadsheets for projects. Well, that's the early preview, but I'll send an email for that workshop for okay. a room staff. Thank you. So item 10 is executive session in accordance with Colorado Open Meetings Act 24-6-401 plus. That's all we need to read of that. Um, so uh, I believe the intent is to have an annual evaluation of our executive director. And, Rob, I think uh, 
it would be my preference that we, if we do go into executive session that you stick with us for a little while. And Barb, I think you'll stay with us also. And then uh, maybe uh, you could excuse yourself at some point and we could talk amongst ourselves a little bit. Does that sound like a plan for everybody? Okay, so with that, is there a motion to go into executive session? Based so upon moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we'll give everybody a little bit of time. And uh, I apologize. Usually I would never go this late without a restroom break, but I figured just keep soldiering on and, you know, we can slip away as needed. So. Do we have a quorum? <laughs> I know.